All right. Sergeants, if you could begin your recordings. Uh, PC recording is underway. I'm recording good. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Jones, if you would go ahead. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or on silent. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. And again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. And thank you for your cooperation. And Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you so much. Um, good morning. Uh, I'm Councilmember Francisco Moya, Chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. Uh, I am joined remotely today by Council Members um, Rivera, Richards, Gredenchek, Barron, uh, and Levin. Uh, but before we begin, I would like to note that the pre-considered LUs for the special uh, Flushing Waterfront District proposal uh, are being laid over. Today, we will hold public hearings for the number of pre-considered LU items, including the Bedford Avenue overlay extension under ULERP number C200158, uh, ZMK, the um, um, Mansion Restaurant Sidewalk Cafe under ULERP number N00078, uh, ZRM and the 803 Rockaway Avenue rezoning under ULERP number uh, C00056 ZMK and N0057 ZRK and two zoning actions related to the uh, 312 Coney Island Avenue rezoning proposal under ULERP number C00092 ZMK and N00093. A third action related to the uh, Coney Island proposal for a zoning special permit application is expected to be calendared for the hearing at a future meeting. But before we begin, I want to recognize the subcommittee council to review the remote meeting procedures. Thank you, Chair Moya. I am Arthur Ha, counsel for the subcommittee. Members of the public wishing to testify were asked to register for today's hearing. If you wish to testify and have not already done so, we ask that you visit the council's website at www.council.nyc.gov to sign up. For members of the public viewing today's meeting online, please note that the council is providing a live stream broadcast with ASL interpretation. This option can be found on the council's website at www.council.nyc.gov forward slash live stream. When called to testify, individuals appearing before the subcommittee will remain muted until recognized by the chair to speak. The applicant teams will be recognized as a group and called first. Members of the public will be called and recognized as panels in groups of up to four names at a time. When the chair recognizes you, your microphone will be unmuted. Please take a moment to check your device and confirm that your mic is on before you begin speaking as there is a slight delay in the process of unmuting. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to, to consider, or if you have written testimony you wish to submit instead of appearing before the subcommittee, you may email it to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number and or project name in the subject line of your email. During the hearing, council members with questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of your participant panel. Council members with questions will be announced in the order as they raise their hands and Chair Moyo will recognize members to speak. Witnesses are reminded to remain in the meeting until they are excused by the chair as council members may have questions. Finally, there will be pauses over the course of this meeting due to various technical reasons. And we'll ask that you all please be patient as we work through any issues. Chair Moya will now continue with today's agenda item. Thank you, Arthur. Um, I now open the public hearing on the pre-considered uh, LU item for the Bedford Avenue overlay extension relating to property in council member uh, Reynosa's district in Brooklyn. Uh, the ULIP application number for this pre-considered item is C200158ZMK. 
The application includes a zoning map amendment to establish a C24 commercial overlay district within an existing R6B district along the west side of Bedford Avenue between Grand Street and North First Street in Williamsburg, in Williamsburg Brooklyn. Uh, if approved, the proposal would facilitate the development of a three-story mixed-use building at 276 Bedford Avenue with ground floor commercial use and the residential use on the upper floors. Uh, before we hear from the applicant, I would like to first uh, go to, oh, I'm sorry, we don't uh, have Council Member Reno, so do we? No? Okay. Uh, seeing that we don't have the Council Member here, um, I'd like to uh, also recognize that we've been joined by Council Member Lander. Uh, and now I'd like to uh, turn it over to our Council to please call the first panel uh, for this item. The applicant panel for this item will include Ben Stark, Land Use Council appearing on behalf of the applicant 223 Trapman LLC. Mr. Stark, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. And Council, if uh, you could uh, please administer the affirmation when the panelists uh, are ready. Mr. Stark, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth uh, in your testimony before the subcommittee and in answer to all council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, we are in receipt of your uh, slideshow presentation for this proposal. Uh, when you are ready to present the slideshow, please say so, and it will be displayed on the screen for you by our staff. Slides will be uh, advanced for you when you say next. Please note that there may be a slight delay in both the initial loading and the advancing of the slides. As a technical note for the benefit of the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, and now if the panelists would please uh, restate your name uh, and affirmation for the record, you may begin. Hi. Thank you, Chair Moya. My name is Ben Stark. I'm, I'm Land Use Counsel at Hirsch and Singer and Epstein. Uh, I'm the applicant's representative, uh, uh, the owner and applicant for this, this um, zoning math amendment is 223 Troutman LLC, uh, which is not to be confused with the project development site 276 Bedford Avenue uh, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, we please uh, make go ahead with the, the presentation. Thank you. Great, and uh, I'm not sure if I have functionality here. So do I just say next slide, uh, Chair Moya? You're on mute, but all right, I'll, I'll just get going. Uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, you just say next and then we'll we'll have the uh, staff move it along with you. Cool, thank you. Okay. Uh, as, as Chair Moya uh, graciously introduced, this is the Bedford Avenue Overlay Extension, which is a zoning map amendment um, whose name generally describes what, what is happening here. Uh, it's a rezoning application to extend an existing C24 commercial overlay um, over a 2,700 square foot property on the corner of North First Street and Bedford Avenue in uh, Williamsburg Community District 1. Uh, as Chair Moy said, this rezoning would facilitate the development of a new three-story building, um, and the building would have ground floor retail, which is being facilitated by the, the, the overlay extension, uh, in it, and apartments on a second and third floor, one apartment each, um, proposed to be rentals. Uh, next slide, please. Um, kind of already gone over a few elements of this, but uh, this application um, is, is, is in a way, it, it's being done to develop a vacant property that is only partially within a commercial overlay on a, on a corner um, of, a, of, a, of a, a retail focused street, Bedford Avenue. Uh, the applicant, um, upon getting into contract for the property determined that uh, less than 50% of the property uh, was within an existing commercial overlay and so the zoning map amendment application was initiated to to complete um, the uh, uh, the 
uh, to move the overlay over the entirety of the 2,700 square foot site so that a full uh, uh, ground floor, um, so, the, so the full ground floor of the proposed building could, could accommodate retail uses. The zoning map amendment application proposes no change to the underlying R6B designation uh, that governs uh, development of the site. And so the property is, is permitted today to be developed to 2FAR and will continue to be um, permitted to be developed to 2FAR after this, this application or should this application be approved. Um, the proposed building, like I said, three stories, two residential units, uh, ground floor commercial uses um, will be, as we'll show in a little bit, uh, in, in context with buildings that surround um, reaching a height of around 39 feet, uh, no parking or other or residential amenities are proposed other than other than a, uh, an outdoor terrace for the second unit above part of the, the, the commercial ground floor. Next slide. Right, so this is this is where we are. Uh, the map on the right kind of locates you to um, uh, kind of the border between south and north side of uh, uh, Williamsburg. Uh, the vacant property, or the property, like I said, is vacant, corner North 1st and Bedford Avenue. A lot of people know this site it, it, uh, in that uh, it's on a very busy street, a lot, gets a lot of foot traffic, and uh, for many years under a prior owner had a, um, a number of uh, garden gnomes uh, uh, making residence in, on, on the lawn. And so every time we've made presentations to people on this project, they've always pointed that out. Next slide. Uh, just bringing us down to the pedestrian level. Uh, next slide. That's looking up north first towards the water. Now kind of looking back, uh, uh, looking south down Bedford. Now looking north up Bedford. Um, and leave it here on this, this uh, oh, on the, on the zoning map, please. So the map on, I, I'm sure uh, uh, members of the committee, subcommittee have seen uh, zoning change maps before. Our map on the left is, is the existing uh, zoning map and the map on the right is what is proposed. Uh, the map on the left shows, if, we, if you can locate yourself to the, the corner of Bedford Avenue and Grand, you'll notice that the existing C24 commercial overlay is mapped within a hundred feet of Grand Avenue. Uh, it looks, if you look at the map, like the, the entirety of the corner of Bedford and North First is within a commercial overlay already. But uh, when a surveyor actually lays out what a 100 foot distance is from Grand Avenue, uh, you'll see that, that the property on the corner of North First and Bedford isn't completely covered. And so if you look to your right uh, at, the, at the other map, you'll see that our, the proposal is to is to extend this overlay uh, mapped within 100 feet of Bedford Avenue as well as being within 100 feet of Grand. Next slide. And this this tax map uh, uh, annotated tax map um, shows this dynamic a little better. Uh, you'll see again that the existing overlay uh, extends 100 feet from Grand Ab or Grand Street um, and only catches just kind of a corner of, of the, propo the proposed development site, a, an area of approximately 600 square feet. Uh, and so by extending it to be with also within 100 feet of Bedford Avenue, um, the entirety of the development site um, is then zoned within the commercial overlay. Uh, next slide, please. The proposed building, uh, three stories uh, with ground floor commercial, is um, similar to the most recent building that had been on this this property. So we went back and took a look at the the '40s tax map, which I'm sure um, many members of the committee and the public have have spent time poking around and looking at. And and this this image here is is the building that had previously existed at the site. In which, from what we understand, um, was demolished sometime in, in in the 70s or 80s. Next slide. The proposed building, like we said, and similar to what was there in the past, 
three stories, uh, ground floor commercial, um, set back at the second and third levels in the rear to provide light and air to the, the apartments on the second and third story. Um, entrances to the proposed commercial unit would be on Bedford um, and on North First, just a short distance from Bedford um, in order to provide a buffer uh, between the commercial use and the residential building uh, adjacent to this site on North First. Next slide, please. Uh, what we have here is, is, is a rendering and it's just an illustrative rendering produced um, maybe 18 months ago um, that provides the committee and, and members of the public with just some context of, of like what the scale of this building would be. But this is not the, the, what uh, the applicant proposes as far as uh, finishing materials. Um, so when we presented this building before the commission, um, the city planning commission, one of the comments that came out of that process was um, a desire for the buildings finishing materials to be more similar to to those of the buildings that surround and so that that is what the applicant and owner intends to do uh, we're looking into a red brick building um, next slide please and this is this is the the thought process this is very recent so coming out of the commission process they had us look at um, uh, the, the, the materiality of neighboring buildings. And so um, that's what we did. And you can see here that we were just starting to look at what's going on next door, the red brick, there's a couple different shades. Um, like we see this in many areas of the city, but um, some cool stuff going on here is some brick detailing along the edges, along the parapets, um, some mixing of materiality along window lintels. These are all the things that that the owner is, is going to do uh, or consider doing when designing a red brick building that is going to be more in keeping with with the the, the context that surrounds while also maybe um, you know standing out a little bit we, we talked about doing a red brick that is is red but not the exact same red as what's going on next door some visual intrigue we think is is nice so uh, next slide Uh, other comments that came out of the early part of ULERP were um, some pointed comments by the borough president to have the, the applicant and owner look into um, uh, uh, some sustainability measures and, and uh, uh, some uh, kind of pedestrian focused um, uh, improvements. And so uh, the, the owner and applicant are, is, is committed to, as part of their builder's pavement plan, um, adopt a uh, developing with, you know, with uh, uh, coordination with, with DEP and DOT, uh, the rain gardens um, that you sometimes see um, uh, adjacent to new developments, the, uh, the bioswales. Um, and also uh, the, the applicant owner is going to pursue, or at least going to talk to DOT about uh, maybe extending the sidewalk at the corner of North First and Bedford with one of those, um, I don't quite know the term for them, they kind of, the bump out. Thing. You see it in the bottom picture there. Uh, so we haven't yet talked to DOT about those those things, but uh, we see them throughout the city. So I I would imagine that that it's something that could be done here. Um, other comments that came out of the the borough president um, uh, portion of ULERP, uh was was uh, wondering whether or not the applicant has um, uh, made a commitment to uh, a local hiring or MWBE part participation. And, and that's something that the applicant um, intends to look into. Uh, we, we went back uh, during the borough president process and, and checked to see if uh, the, the owner has already been using MWBEs without maybe no, quite knowing so. And, and it turns out a number of the subs that, that he's used on other projects uh, are, are minority owned, but actually aren't registered as MWBEs. So we've we've been trying um, to to get a few of these these uh, smaller subcontractors uh, registered. Um, you know, it's 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 been kind of an illuminating process figuring out that it it as much as it's it's easy in some respects um, for for you know people who are owner operator subcontractors who 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 get up every day and and you know are out in the field. It's it's it can be burdensome to to find the time 
to, to be able to go through these, these processes. So we're trying to be as helpful as we can to some of these subcontractors so that um, they can get the, the recognition that they deserve and they can be part of maybe public hiring um, processes in the future. Um, and then also the facade treatment thing is the last bullet here. We, we already talked about that. Um, next slide, please. That's it. Um, so I, you know, I hope this presentation clarified um, what's going on with this, this project and application. And I'm, of course, here to answer any and all questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin, for that. Just a, a, a couple of questions um, before we move on. Um, just how long has the, the property been uh, vacant? I think we think from the research we've done that it was in the 80s that that building uh, came down. Um, it was owned in a, our client closed on it last spring. They, they had been in contract for the, the first part of like the pre-certification process and, and eventually they, they had to close regardless of what's happening here. Uh, the prior owner, I think, I think it was held in a, in a family trust and, and, uh, and maybe there, that, that complicated redevelopment. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a long time, decades. Okay. Um, and why was the commercial overlay not mapped uh, over this part of the block historically? Do you know? We don't. I mean, we can't speak for city planning um, personally. So I know I'm on record here. I just think it was missed. I think that that... I, you see it on the zoning map. It looks like it covers it. I, I think these are the wrinkles of 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 these processes that that zoning maps get drawn and people look at them. Okay, we got it. We, we caught what we wanted to catch. And then when you actually kind of zoom in and really peel back layers of the onion, we some things like this fall through the cracks. That's my guess. Got it. Um, and does the applicant intend to develop the property or uh, sell it to? Uh, a future developer? No, so no, no. They're, they they fully intend to build themselves. They they're this is about the scale of project that they have experience with. They uh, uh, our client um, has th three or four projects of this size ongoing in the Williamsburg area, uh, all relatively the same typology. Uh, three four story buildings with ground floor um, uh, uh, commercial. They're that's that's what they're their their kind of investment strategy is is, is retail got it so just so so just because that was my next question so the 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 ground floor uh business that you envision locating um there is 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 commercial yeah yeah and 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 as you can imagine they don't have any idea who who, who uh will eventually lease it i mean they're they're um they had had some initial conversations just with with brokers a, a year ago, and and given everything that's happened, um, I think that uh, potential tenants are going to want to see a building done before and, and tour for, for for spaces of this size because now there's a lot of avail more availability on the market. Um, it, it's going to be pretty hard to secure a tenant before the building is done. Um, so I, I we can't answer who who it would be this right. time and you, my last question and you might have um uh said this in your presentation and forgive me if, if you did but uh what if any uh su sustainability and resiliency measures are incorporated into the building design and construction so the building itself will have to comply with um um uh, uh provisions of the of the building code and and local law uh requiring uh either green or blue roof um, uh, uh, components, um, as well as um, uh, 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 there's a, well, there's the, the code in the local law gives you a choice between certain blue roof components and certain green roof components. And they haven't gotten to that part, part of the, desi the design process to actually decide which one, but um, it, the building will comply with, with the local law requirements that, that ensure that, uh, you know, the building will be um, definitely more sustainable than than you know existing pre-war buildings that you know neighbor it. Great, um, that's that's it for me. Um, so uh, let me uh, let me turn to our our council to see if there's any members uh, who have uh, 
any questions, uh, please uh, indicate by um, using the raised hand button. Um, and I just wanted to turn it over to our council to see if there's any council members that have any questions for their, this panel. Emily, a council member Gradenchik uh, has a hand up for a question. Uh, just one quick question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Arthur. Um, the, you mentioned a rain garden. Um, who's going to be responsible? That's my cat, by the way. Who's going to be responsible? Uh, he has too much food. That's why he's complaining. Uh, who's going to be responsible for the rain garden maintenance? You know, uh, in, in various parts of the city before COVID, um, I've seen that they are not maintained as often as they are maintained. I'm getting a load of them in my district because of a consent decree. Um, and I'm just curious about, uh, will the owner be responsible? Is DEP going to be responsible? Or have you gotten that far? That's a, that's a really good question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, we, that's something we can definitely follow up in writing and provide an answer there. I would appreciate uh, that. I mean, I'm, I'm, as a member of the public, I'm curious, is that a, is that part of the, like the, the, the shovel, your snow dynamic as, as a um, neighbor property owner? I don't do you know about that? that. So it's something maybe uh, not, not necessarily for this committee. It may be for the, the environmental committee, but um, I thank you for your candor. Yeah, we'll, we'll get, right. I'll, I'll, I'll look into that and, and, and we'll follow up in writing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members with any uh, questions? Jeremiah, no, no, uh, I see no members with questions. Yeah, that's uh, there being no further questions, um, the applicant uh, panel is now excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the Bedford Avenue application? Yes, Jeremiah, there is uh, one public witness currently signed up to speak. Uh, we will now hear from that first witness who will be Linda Brilliant. And Ben, you're, 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 you're excused. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank you, Chair Moy, and, and, and thank you, uh, members of the committee and, and council. Great. Thank you. And staff, thank you. Thank you. And now members of the, the public who uh, you will be given uh, two minutes to speak. Uh, please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms has started the clock. Um, and if the first witness is ready, uh, you may begin. Arthur, do we have um, the next witness? Uh, apologies, Chair. We we did have a witness signed up, but it appears that we don't have that individual at this time. So uh, we will briefly stand at ease just to confirm uh, that there are no other members of the public signed up to speak. Um, Great, thank you. Pardon me, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, there are no other members of the public. There are no members of the public uh, signed up to speak on this item. Okay. Uh, there being, uh, let's see, one second. Uh, if there are no other members of the public uh, who wish to testify on the pre-considered LU item uh, for the Bedford Avenue overlay extension, um, please press the raise hand button now. Uh, the meeting will stand at ease. We'll check if th there being no other members of the public. I apologize for that. Um, seeing that we have no members of the public who wish to testify on this item, 
Uh, there will be no other members uh, testifying on this item uh, of the Bedford Avenue overlay extension proposal. Uh, the public hearing is now closed and the application is laid over. I now open the public hearing on the a mansion restaurant sidewalk cafe text amendment relating to the property in council member Kalos's district in Manhattan. The Euler application number for this pre-considered item is N00078ZRM. The application includes a zoning text amendment, which would allow unenclosed sidewalk cafes uh, within the C15 district at the northeast corner of York Avenue and East 86th Street. If approved, this action would facilitate uh, subject to a separate sidewalk cafe licensing process through the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, uh, formerly the Department of Consumer Affairs, uh, an unenclosed sidewalk cafe with 23 tables and 47 seats, accessory to the uh, Mansion Cafe located at uh, 1634 York Avenue. Uh, Council, if you could uh, please call the first panel for this item. The applicant panel will include Neil Weisbart, Land Use Counsel for the applicant, and available for questions will be John Phillips, affiliate uh, owner of the restaurant in question. Mr. Phillips and Mr. Weisbart, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request uh, in order to begin to speak. Hi, Neil Weisbart on behalf of the applicant. I will be presenting and John Phillips, who is the owner and applicant, will is here to answer any questions that the committee may have. Great, thank you. Um, Council, if you could please administer the affirmation. Mr. Weitzfeld and Mr. Phillips, if you'd please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth uh, in your testimony before the subcommittee and in answer to all council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have received your uh, slideshow presentation for this proposal, and whenever you're ready to present, please say so, and the presentation will be displayed on the screen for you by our staff. Uh, slides will be advanced for you when you say next. Please note that there may be a slight delay in both the initial loading and the advancing of slides. As a reminder, members of the public uh, needing an accessible version of this presentation uh, you can send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now uh, the panelists, if you can please restate your name and affirmation for the record, uh, and then uh, you may begin. Hi, Neil Weisbart from Prior Cashman on behalf of the applicant, and I am ready for the slideshow. So I appear before you on behalf of the Yorkville Mansion Inc, which is located, it's a the mansion restaurant, which is located at 1634 York Avenue. Next, please. The application seeks an amendment to section 1441 of the zoning resolution to allow an unenclosed sidewalk cafe on the north side of East 86th Street within 125 east of York Avenue. The application only seeks an unenclosed sidewalk cafe and enclosed sidewalk cafes will still not be permitted pursuant to this amendment. Next, please. The, this area was determined based on the following land use considerations. Next. Primarily to coincide with the boundary of the C15 commercial district on the north side of East 86th Street. And this is typically the case with sidewalk cafe regulations. They are mapped within a commercial overlay, at approximately 125 feet from a wide avenue. Next, please. Uh, sidewalk cafes are already permitted on both York Avenue and East 85th Street, but only within the C15 commercial district. So there is no need for the text amendment to apply to such area. Next, please. Sidewalk cafes are permitted on both York Avenue and East 87th Street, again, within the C15, and therefore no need to extend the text amendment to such area. Next, please. Next. 
Uh, the portions south of the text amendment area are located within a residential district in which sidewalk cafes are not permitted. So that area was not included as well. Next, please. Next. Uh, also, it's on the south, the C1 district on the south side of East 86th Street is being developed with a long-term long care facility with only residential uses. So that's why this area was excluded as well. Next, please. Next. Uh, the, there was a environmental assessment statement prepared as part of the city planning application. And it took a hard look at all the impacts and found that unenclosed sidewalk cafes could easily be accommodated on that stretch without negatively impacting the flow of pedestrian traffic. And it would complement existing commercial uses, enhance the streetscape and bring more vitality to the area without inhibiting pedestrian circulation. Next. And the EARD from city planning held that there will be no significant effect and issued a negative declaration. Next. As demonstrated by the tremendous outpouring of support, including a favorable determination recommendation from the community board, city planning commission and borough president Gail Brewer's favorable recommendation in which the borough president held that the proposed text amendment will be a true added benefit to the surrounding area and add to the public welfare. Next, please. And based on these con considerations, that's the land use justification for the proposed text amendment area. Next, please. The, I know that it was mentioned that the uh, cafe will have 23 tables but based on some of the concerns from the community board, the layout has been reduced to 10 tables and 36 chairs. I know that's not really subject of this text amendment, but we wanted to let everyone know that that's the proposal right now. 10 tables, 36 chairs with a removable railing and a retractable awning. Next, please. Here is a plan of the site. Uh, it, next, please, the, the next slide. So as you can see, there is ample room between the proposed area where the sidewalk cafe will be located and on the sidewalk, there will be a minimum of eight and a half feet from a tree planter, but primarily the open space is 13 feet, one inch. And as we move on, I'll show you some photos that evidence this. Next, please. This is the area where the cafe will be located. Uh, the yellow tape indicates the boundary of the sidewalk cafe. Next, please. This is everyone's favorite photo, but we have four gentlemen showing the distance between that tree pit, which is the narrowest area of the sidewalk, and the border of the sidewalk cafe. And as you can see from these photos, there is plenty of room for pedestrian traffic. Next, please. Uh, here is a bird's eye view of the sidewalk. As you can see, there's plenty of room. Next, please. Uh, this is where the tables will be located, a rough rendering. Next, please. And finally, this is the actual text amendment. And that is the presentation, as I mentioned, John Phillips and his father, Phil Phillips. And I also want to mention, which I neglected, that this mansion restaurant has been located on this site since 1945. The Phillips are actually in their third generation of operating this restaurant. And they're here as well to answer any questions, as am I. Great, thank you. Um, just uh, two quick questions for you. Um, will the neighboring property owner on uh, East 86th Street uh, be able to take advantage of this sidewalk cafe eligibility as well? Yes, it extends 125 feet to a portion of their property. If they decide to put a restaurant in there, yes, they could have a sidewalk cafe, but only that within that on the north side within 125 feet of it. Uh, and, and just lastly, given that the mayor has indicated that the city 
uh, will codify the outdoor dining program. Uh, why not just uh, use that instead of pursuing the text amendment? So that's a good question that, that if it was codified, well, we were so far in the process that we continued. We had already met with the community board, obtained their favorable recommendation. And right now it's still a, an executive order which could be rescinded by the next mayor. So we just wanna ensure that the zoning resolution reflects that this use would be permitted regardless of what happens with that executive order. I can't, I can't talk with uh, That's it for me. Uh, but uh, now I just want to invite any of my colleagues uh, to ask questions. If you have questions for the applicant panel, uh, please use the raise hand button on the participant panel. Uh, council, are there any council members with uh, questions? Uh, Chair Moy, I see no members at this time with questions for the panel. Okay. Um, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the mansion, restaurant, sidewalk, cafe application? Chair Moya, uh, there are no public witnesses signed up to speak on this application. There being uh, no other members of the public who wish to testify on the pre-considered LU item for the uh, mansion restaurant sidewalk cafe application, the public hearing is now closed and the application is laid over. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your testimony today. Thank you. Uh, we will now move to uh, uh, LU 803 Rockaway Avenue rezoning. I now open the public hearing on the 803 Rockaway Avenue rezoning relating to property in council member Barron's district in Brooklyn. Uh, the Euler application number for these pre-considered items are N20057ZRK uh, and C200056ZMK. The application includes a zoning map amendment to change an M11 district to a mix of M14 to an R7A and an M14 uh, and R6A districts, uh, as well as a zoning text amendment to establish the special mixed use district uh, MX19 to modify certain use regulations in the MX19 district and to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing util area utilizing option one. These actions would facilitate the development of a new building with ground floor manufacturing uses, uh, community facility uses, and approximately 174 affordable and supportive housing units. Uh, I would like to now recognize my colleague, uh, Council Member Barron, uh, for uh, her statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you to the panel and to my colleagues for being here to consider this matter. Uh, just want to say in full disclosure that I'm very familiar with the location of this site because it faces PS 41 on Thatford Avenue, which is where I was a staff member and assistant principal for many years, I guess about 18 years or at least 10 years. So I'm very familiar with the site. It used to be the manufacturing site of chocolate and we had a great relationship with the uh, manufacturers there and they used to give our school little goodies from time to time to supplement pro programs that were going on. So I'm familiar with the site. It's been vacant for many years and now we have an opportunity to consider how we're going to utilize that space to benefit the community. So I have been in conversation with the developer and have listened to their presentations and their plans. I believe they have a favorable recommendation from the community board. I'm sure they'll address that in their presentation. And I'm concerned and want to know particularly how they're going to make sure that the industrial part of the development will not in any way be injurious or hazardous to the residents that are there. So I will look forward to their presentation today and I will have questions following that. And thank you so much, Mr. Chair, for allowing me this time to make my introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, Council, if you can please call the first panel for this item. 
The applicant panel will include Susan Wiviat of the, of the bridge, Brian Coleman, uh, the bridge being the applicant, Brian Coleman of Greenpoint Manufacturing and Design Center partnering with the bridge on the manufacturing component, Penny King, Land Use Council for the applicant, and Don Flagg, the project architect. Also available for questions on this panel are Hercules Argirio, Kate Gilmore, and Carol Gordon. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request uh, in order to begin to speak. Thank you, Thank you Arthur. Um, if you could please uh, administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hand. Do you, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this uh, subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes. I do. Yes, I do. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have received your slideshow presentation for this proposal, and when you are uh, ready to present it, please uh, say so, and it will be displayed on the screen for you. Slides will be advanced for you when you say next. Please note that there may be a slight delay in both the initial loading and the advancing of slides. Um, members of the public needing an accessible, uh, an accessible version of this presentation are asked to please send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Um, and now panelists, if you can just please state your name and affirmation for the record. And with that, uh, we may begin. Um, my name is Susan Wiviet. I'm the CEO of The Bridge, and I will be presenting the slide presentation, and the other members of the panel will be available to speak in more detail about some of the questions that I'm sure people will have. So we can start this up, the slide presentation. Great. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Moya, and thank you, Council Member Barron, who we have met with on a number of occasions to talk about this project and to get um, her input. And yes, we did get a favorable recommendation from the community board. Um, we've also worked, so we've been working very closely with them over the course of this, uh, developing this project. Um, the development team includes the bridge. We're a nonprofit organization that works with people with mental illness. We provide housing um, as well as treatment services. We have GMDC. Uh, which provide, which will own and operate, uh, it's also a nonprofit, own and operate um, the commercial space, Mega, who is our uh, uh, construction um, partner, and Think, uh, our architect partner, and I'd particularly like to recognize Penny King, who's been our counsel on this project. Um, as you can see, this is a rendering of the building bounded by uh, Rockaway Avenue, um, uh, and, and as council member mentioned, Thatford Avenue um, and then Newport uh, in the front. Um, it's two, the, the little ground floor space is the manufacturing space and then two residential towers with a large um, outdoor space on the roof of the manufacturing space for the use of the residents of the building. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we're a nonprofit organization. We have uh, housing and treatment services throughout Manhattan, the Bronx, and Brooklyn. We currently house about 1,400 people in buildings that we own. We own 26 buildings um, and in scattered site apartments. And we have uh, over 500 uh, units of housing in development. We are literally in the process of renting up a building right now, um, 3500 Park Avenue in the Bronx. Um, and we've been around uh, doing this for quite a while. Next slide, please. Uh, like the bridge, GMDC is a nonprofit real estate developer. They develop multi-tenant manufacturing buildings. Usually they repurpose existing buildings. Uh, in this case, it will be for the first time new construction for them. They own and manage over 700,000 square feet of affordable manufacturing space. As I mentioned, like the bridge, they're a nonprofit. So we're really, it's two mission-driven nonprofits working together to develop a project, which we think will bring a lot of benefits to the community. 
Also, the last point here, um, the vast majority of GMBC workers are New York City residents. They live often near their facilities and they, um, you know, pay taxes and, have, and create jobs in New York City. Next slide, please. This is the site, as the council member mentioned, it's across straight from a school on Thadford Avenue and then bounded by uh, Riverdale Avenue in the, in the far back and the Rockaway and uh, Newton, uh, right, Newport right there, um, um, bounds it on three sides directly. Next slide, please. Um, this is a I, this is a, a version. I just want to say one other thing about the um, about the site. The, you know, the last slide of the site, which is that it is only it is two blocks south of the Rockaway Avenue uh, subway station. So it's actually very accessible. There's also a lot of buses that run in the area. It's very accessible to people that will be living in the building. This is a rendering of the ground floor space. Um, there's, as you can see, three en entrances. The GMDC entrance is on the Rockaway, will be on the Rockaway Avenue side, which is the more commercial side. That's where the people who are working in the manufacturing spaces will come and go. On the Thatford side, as you can see where the arrow is, uh, that is the community facility entrance. There is a small community facility space. We have had numerous conversations with um, Community Board 16 about uh, what they would like to see there. And I think there's um, a lot of enthusiasm for trying to identify some sort of financial services institution like a credit union that would be an appropriate tenant for a community facility space, but would bring some services to the community that they really feel they need. And then um, on the Newport side is the entrance to the building. People will walk into the building and either using the stairs or the elevators, it's a wide open stairway, uh, will be able to go to the second floor where there's the outdoor space also the offices for the bridge and uh, all of the public the amenities for the building, such as the community rooms, the laundry room, the computer room, and all of those are adjacent to the outdoor space. Next slide, please. So this is the Thatford Avenue elevation. Um, as you can see, uh, as you'll see on both uh, the, on these slides uh, with the elevation slides, the, um, the manufacturing uh, the manufacturing extends to the street line so that we can, ma we can maximize essentially the amount of manufacturing space. But the buildings, the taller parts of the buildings themselves are set back and then angled so it's not so bulky on the street front and sort of the, you know visually it's a little less, it feels a little less bulky. Um, we have you know, had some discussions with the council member about the materials going to be an all brick building um, using uh, a couple of different colors of brick again to create some visual interest so it's not so monolithic and then some colored bricks on the ground floor along with the windows um, around the manufacturing spaces it's not retail space these uh, manufacturers do not sell directly to the public and so wide open windows while they're working didn't really wouldn't really work but we did create some windows at the top and along the sides just to make it seem a little more open and to create a little more interest as people are walking along uh, the street. Next slide please. Again it's a little hard to see here but similar to the other side the residential part of the building is set back and angles. Uh, the, it is uh, seven stories on the Rockaway side and six on the Thatford Avenue side. And again, there's the windows and the colored brick at the street level. Next slide, please. Um, again, we, we had some discussion both with the community, with the community board and city planning commission about uh, how, how the building would interact with the community garden. There's a community garden in the, in the corner of the site, uh, which is, is a parks department uh, community garden, which of course will remain there. Um, and so we wanted it to have the interface between the garden and the building um, 
be welcoming and accessible. And so we work to create the, the windows uh, along the, the building um, adjacent to the garden. They're a little higher up, so people won't be looking right in at the residence, but it will create some opening, also some light in the corridor. Um, you can see the where the little 700 is there. That is the building entrance on Newport Avenue. Um, so people will be, the residents of the building will be coming in and out of that entrance. And then the front um, brings a lot of light into the lobby and up to the second floor that uh, the walls of, of windows right there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a rendering of the courtyard, not what it's going to look like at all, just to sort of show how it's going to sit between the two buildings. It's quite large, and we are working with a landscape architect to design uh, the space and to carve out different areas for more active play and more quiet uh, uh, quiet uses. Um, there will be patios adjacent to the community room so we can have sort of indoor outdoor activities um, and spaces for the for the different for the clients. We will also have um, some uh, urban farming activities on the roof where the uh, residents of the building can uh, work uh, plant fruit and vegetables and and flowers and we have an ongoing relationship with the Horticultural Society of New York, and they work with us on a lot of our urban farms, uh, working with the clients to engage them in horticulture and in how to utilize the various um, things that they're growing. Next slide. Um, in terms of economic development, there's really three components. Uh, one is the residential building. Uh, the building itself will support, the residential building will support approximately 20 professional, paraprofessional maintenance positions in the residential programs. And we have um, had some discussions with the council member and with Community Board 16 about how we will do outreach and job fairs around ensuring that um, the local community knows of the availability of those jobs and uh, is in a position to apply for them. Um, uh, GMDC estimates based on its experience that the 39,000 square foot space will generate approximately 35 uh, light manufacturing jobs and MEGA will be partnering with Building Skills New York and coordinating with Hire in New York City um, and the community-based organizations to maximize local and MWBE hiring and I'm sure they will be glad to talk a little bit more about that. Um, in more detail um, after the formal presentation. They have you know, done a lot of thinking around how to work with the community around um, hiring. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is the breakdown of the units and, and the residents. It will be a 50-50 building, 50% permanent supported housing and 50% affordable housing. So there's 87 units of each. The supported units, you can see the breakdown. There will be 52 uh, New York City 1515 units, which will be formerly homeless adults with mental health conditions. And then 35 ESHA units, which is the state supported housing initiative uh, that will be for homeless seniors and veterans. Um, uh, the, the, the supported units are mostly studios, and there's a few one bedrooms. Um, and then the affordable units, you can see the breakdown between the one, two, and three bedroom units. Um, these are deeply affordable units. 70% of the affordable units are at the 30 and 40% AMI. And as you can see, there's also a generous number of two and three bedroom units, which would be appropriate for families. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the land use actions, which you're familiar with, um, changing the M11 district to an M14 R6A and to an M14 R7A, uh, one being for the Thatford side and one being for the Rockaway side, and also establishing a special mixed use district, um, and then uh, requesting a zoning text amendment. Um, for the purpose of amending the restrictions for certain uses in the mixed use district, which has to do with the manufacturing 
and establishing a mandatory inclusion, inclusionary housing area. We can certainly answer your questions about this also uh, if, uh, if you have any. Um, next slide, please. Um, the, the proposed tax amendments, as you can see, this, this is what will permit GMDC to occupy the building that also contains residential uses. Um, there would be additional manufacturing uses, but we've been working very closely with DEP and the, and the buildings department to, 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 to limit those uses to, to things that um, everybody, uh, that we know will be safe for the residents. And then, and we can go into much greater detail about this later. We have um, included significant mitigation uh, uh, aspects to the, the construction of the building that will, um, we believe, eliminate any smell, uh, uh, noxious fume issues, as well as noise and vibrations. And as Brian always said, the goal is that nobody upstairs knows what's going on downstairs um, and to really make sure that the residents are safe. Um, we, we spent a, a lot of time working on this. I think we all believe that we have uh, excellent safeguards in place. And I think, you know, from a, a broader perspective, um, the, the kind of work that we did could, uh, you know, help pave the way, I think, for other projects that might want to do something uh, similar and really maximize uh, the, the, the use of the underlying piece of property. Next slide. Uh, this, that was the end of the formal presentation. We do have a number of appendices um, that speak more specifically to the um, affordability and, as I said, the mitigation uh, efforts that we have put in place around uh, the manufacturing uses. We are happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I just got a couple of questions before I turn it over to um, uh, Council Member Barron. I know you touched upon uh, this in your presentation, but you know, uh, as you're uh, considering uh, the tenants uh, that are coming into the manufacturing uh, facility, uh, do you have any tenants reached out, anyone that expressed interest uh, already uh, in coming into that space? I'm actually gonna let uh, I think the answer is no, because it's really too early, but I'm going to let Brian speak a little bit about uh, the success in attracting clients and um, their current spaces right now. Good morning. This is Brian Coleman from GMDC. Um, no, we haven't, uh, we haven't marketed this space yet um, because, frankly, we don't plan on closing on the project until June. And then we'd have almost two years of construction. So it's a bit premature um, to market the space to the type of tenants that generally occupy one of GMDC's facilities. Um, right now, um, GMDC is more than 95% occupied. Um, as you, I think, all are aware, there have been some recent zoning changes in the Brownsville and East New York area that is going to adversely affect existing manufacturers. Um, so we do not anticipate um, any problems in leasing the 40,000 square feet or so that we'll have when the project is complete. Got it. And I know you, you spoke uh, um, at length about the MWBE process, which is always good to hear. Uh, but just can you just go over once again, I might have missed it. Uh, can you just go and describe the plans um, for local hiring and the outgoing uh, reporting on those plans? Um, yeah, I'm gonna let Hercules uh, respond to that. And I don't know if we can pull up the appendix, there's an appendix in the back, a, a slide that uh, that outlines some of that. It's, um, if you go back to uh, scroll, if you start scrolling through, I'll, I think it's the second slide maybe in the appendix, not that one, next one. There we go, okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, hello. Uh, my name is Hercules Argiri. I'm with Mind Contracting. And uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, having us and uh, listening to our presentation. Uh, so, Mega has uh, been uh, a long uh, builder, uh, 
in uh, the area and uh, we have successfully collaborated with uh, local groups uh, both on hiring and uh, the MWB efforts. Uh, as far as local hiring, uh, we have uh, a couple of projects that are not actually in, uh, uh, in, uh, that, in the community board, but uh, uh, they are in uh, uh, neighboring uh, the community board five. And uh, we have hired the over 20 uh, workers on those sites. They are the 50, 50 Pennsylvania Avenue site and the 405 Dumont Avenue site. Uh, uh, so we, what we do is uh, we collaborate with uh, 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 local uh, uh, partners and uh, uh, through building skills, uh, we uh, collect uh, resumes and uh, vet uh, resumes. We uh, have to get them through Hire YC. Uh, which is uh, mandated by our HPD, HPD contract. And uh, we set the preferential uh, priorities to local, uh, uh, to local workers. What uh, we've also done in connection with the community board, we uh, have committed to provide two 40 hour OSHA training sessions, one early on in the project and one um, uh, when the project, when the buildings, uh, the building is topped off, uh, this way we can provide uh, a training for prospective uh, workers uh, for the early stages of the job and then for the later stages of the job. Um, as far as uh, MWB hiring, uh, uh, we've been extremely successful meeting and exceeding all uh, city uh, requirements uh, for MWB hiring. We've, we've done, uh, uh, we have a, a pool of uh, uh, subcontractors that uh, are MWBs and uh, we're, we keep going out to them. Uh, we also uh, assist uh, subcontractors that could potentially be uh, approved uh, and certified as MWBs and we help them through the process. And, uh, and we solicit on all the lists of the approved uh, MWBs, city, state, uh, and agency lists that are available, inviting MWB subcontractors to come and uh, submit qualifications and uh, uh, pricing. Uh, we are um, very much focused on both uh, the local hiring and then WB, and we keep augmenting our processes to, to make sure that we meet uh, all the goals. Great, thank you. That, that's uh, all the questions I have. Um, I now wanna turn it over to Council Member Barron um, for some questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you asked some of the very important questions that I was going to ask and I, I thank you for that. Uh, now, in terms of the positions that you've been able to prepare uh, through your own training for community residents through OSHA and such. What have been some of the titles that these uh, hires have been able to fill? What are the job titles that they have when you talk about local hires in your construction? What are, what are their titles? Laser, yeah, maybe. I'm sorry, okay. So uh, we have uh, obviously, uh, we have a lot of success stories in our uh, uh, local hiring. Uh, what we do is uh, every, uh, every week or every other week, there's a subcontractors uh, um, coordination meeting that uh, we invite building skills to, to attend. And we have uh, somebody from our staff attending where we ask every trade uh, to uh, let us know if they're planning to hire new people. And that's how we create the pool of uh, application sort of, of uh, posi openings rather. Uh, so we've been successful in having uh, 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 people that uh, started as laborers and, and uh, uh, went on to become uh, uh, assistant carpenters and then carpenters. Uh, uh, we have uh, people working with our plumbers as uh, starting as helpers if they don't have any experience and then 
Uh, if uh, if they are successful, they they move on and become plumbers or electricians. So it's uh, uh, we obviously have uh, uh, some uh, uh, people doing general conditions, so cleanup, and that's a starting place for many folks that have not been uh, in the construction site before. Uh, and uh, we try to mentor them and uh, try to tie them with. Uh, uh, subcontractors that uh, are more uh, concentrated on trade. This way they can have a, an upward career in, uh, in construction. Thank in, you. In and, and, I'm sorry, anything else? In addition, we also uh, have, uh, uh, we provide the, uh, some labor monitoring uh, in house, uh, which is uh, uh, we keep track of everybody that's on site, uh, uh, and uh, we, that's how we get all our statistics. And we make sure that everybody that works on the site has all the, cert the requirements or certifications. Uh, so we have uh, a position on every site that's typically filled by a local uh, a recruiter, recruitee, uh, which is a labor monitoring. Uh, and it's, that's a clerical position. And we've seen some of these uh, uh, applicants uh, succeed and become involved in construction uh, on uh, the managerial side. So right now we have in our company uh, uh, two or three uh, people that started with us about four or five years ago as labor monitors. And now one of them is uh, assisting the, our mechanical uh, uh, engineering group in uh, providing uh, sharp drawings for uh, submittals. Uh, so they get they get advanced in in uh, more of uh, managerial levels within the company. Great. And what type of uh, kind of union uh, labor do you expect to have as a part of this position, a part of this development? So the financing for this uh, uh, development is uh, non prevailing wage financing. Uh, we are an open shop uh, company, so we invite both union and non-union companies. Typically, on uh, a project like this, the, uh, uh, most of the trades will be non-union uh, because of the non-prevailing wage. Uh, however, we've seen often uh, plumbers and electricians being able to, union plumbers and electricians being able to provide competitive rates and uh, we often hire them on a non-prevailing wage project. Okay, I'm very concerned that we just don't think that because this is a project with uh, funds that come from the state and the city that we can't inf involve unions. I don't I hope that we don't have that kind of precluding that they will not. Absolutely not. Okay, great. absolutely not. And uh, uh, we we do a lot of work in the city, as, as you may know. And there are sites that we have that are 70% uh, of our uh, of the workforce is union. So we don't preclude anybody from doing work. We are, we feel uh, we're definitely an open shop, and we invite everybody to come in and, and provide uh, bids. Okay. And uh, I don't know that I saw the uh, chart that gives the bedroom mix and unit sizes that are going to be included in this project. I see the total, but I'd so like can to- we, If we can go back to the appendix, I think it was the first slide in the appendix that has okay. the detailed chart. It's page 16. Page 16 of the, of the presentation, and we can look at that again. So okay. this is- this is okay. the slide that has the breakdown yes. by the AMI tiers and by the, num the, the, bed the sizes of the apartments. And as okay. you can see, 35 of the units are at 30% AMI and 28 are at 40% AMI. So there are no studios in this project? The studios um, are the supported housing units. Oh, so okay. So this studios. is the affordable units. This, these are the affordable units. Correct. Okay. So what about the bedroom mix and unit size for the um, supportive? Are they it's, all? It's almost all studios. I think there's a few one bedrooms. Um, okay. That's what we generally utilize um, in the supported housing. Okay. Um, and then just to ask, what, what are your plans for making sure that as the project continues that you reach out to 
that you collaborate with other uh, local organizations to do the outreach when it's time to um, have the applications come in? Um, we, I mean, there, there's two things that we've done. One is, um, and, you know, I know this was a concern of the community board. Yeah. We actually have had conversations with DHS, which they generally don't do, but they have agreed to do it to at least prioritizing the applications from shelters that are in the area, which we're actually very pleased with because it would allow people who are getting services through a shelter in the neighborhood to stay connected to the services that they have. Doesn't mean they'll all be coming from those shelters, but they have agreed to let us prioritize uh, the local shelters. So we we were very it was something that the community board asked for, and we said, sure, we'll you know we'll have some discussions with DHS, and we're really pleasantly surprised that they agreed to work with us on that. Um, in terms of the affordable units, we um, we are the, a couple of things. At the moment, there is a priority for community residents. I know that's been challenged in court. And so the, what happens a couple of years from now, you know, we can't predict, but obviously we support the community. Um, we, we support the community preference and we'll work with the community. We've also talked about, because um, we've noticed that when, pe that when people apply for the affordable units, they often don't know how to apply. They don't have the appropriate documentation. And that is really now all out of our control because it's all being run through HPD. So what we offered to do was have a couple of sort of housing fairs where we would help people who wanted to apply understand how to apply so that when they submitted their applications, they had everything incorrectly and their application would not be rejected. Because that we've seen that in the project we're, we're, um, we're, that we're renting out right now in the Bronx, we have 45 affordable units and a lot of people really don't know how to submit the applications through the electronic portal and what they need to have. So we were totally, you know, work, willing to work with the community in any way we can to advertise locally, to work through the community board and any other nonprofits that want to, to work with local community members around understanding the process for applying for the affordable units and providing assistance to them so that they can apply successfully. Great. And then just finally, uh, in our conversation yesterday, I expressed my uh, concerns about the manufacturing units, the manufacturing entities that will be located on the first floor in terms of making sure that noise and vibration and odors are not offensive and are not in fact uh, noxious or dangerous. Mm -hmm. So I, I did see something in your presentation that talked about that uh, this was subject to restrictive declaration uh, requirements of the DEP approval. So can you talk a little about what that is and will that in fact be a clause in any types of lease that you would have with those entities that will be in the manufacturing units? Penny, do you wanna talk a little bit about the first part and then Brian can talk about the second part and the lease? Sure, so um, the proposed text amendment would only allow these additional manufacturing uses if there's a legally binding document, um, a restrictive declaration on the property that requires the building to have a series of design features that we have developed in consultation with the department. I'm sorry, you said a series of what? A series of design features. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that we've developed in consultation with architects and the Department of Environmental Protection um, and other consultants. So we took a really comprehensive look at um, issues like life safety and fire and egress. Um, and then we studied issues like air quality and noise um, as part of the environmental review, but also based on GMDC's you know, 30 years of experience operating multi-tenanted manufacturing buildings, often very close to residences and schools. Um, so I'm happy to talk more about the specific measures, but um, this has been really carefully vetted by a big team. And, um, you know, we have two very mission-oriented nonprofits here that are really dedicated to making sure that these uses can uh, coexist successfully. Brian, do you want to talk about the leases for a second and what's going sure. to Sure. Sure. I'll jump 
been in talking about the leases. Um, GMDC runs a tight ship. Um, as Petty mentioned, we've been around for 30 years. And in part of the process of, uh, of making sure that we were going to mitigate any type of odor, noise, or any type of pollution, or anything that might bother um, the tenants in this project, we actually shared with DEP the addresses and um, essentially very detailed information about how our existing buildings operate. Um, because, and we were comfortable doing that because we run a tight ship. Um, our leases require that um, our tenants adhere to all rules and regulations. And frankly, unlike a lot of landlords, we welcome the fire department, the building department and department of environmental protection into our buildings because they essentially serve uh, with us as policing mechanisms to make sure that our tenants are operating in a, in a clean and safe manner. Certainly we'll even be more um, cognizant of that here because we're actually mixing residences above the manufacturing space. So we'll be more zealous than ever in making sure that our tenants who have written obligations in their lease adhere to those obligations. And just finally, those manufacturing spaces are all on the Rockaway Avenue side? Um, they no, cover the-, the Go ahead, no, go ahead, Brian. No, go ahead. The, the manufacturing spaces cover um, the large majority of the first floor of the entire facility, except for a carve out on the first floor for the, the first, the ground level lobby for the bridges um, units and the uh, also a carve out for the community space on Newport um, manufacturing space cover the large, regard, large majority of the ground floor. But it's important to recognize that we wanted to make sure that we had as few as apartments as possible above the manufacturing space. So a large majority of that level that's directly above the manufacturing space are common areas or areas that will not be full-time occupied, meaning that there'll be offices and meeting rooms and bathrooms and laundry facilities and whatnot that will be shared by the facility. So um, in our design, working very closely with our architects, think um, we tried to mitigate that issue as much as possible by limiting the number of units that are directly above the manufacturing. And the other thing uh, that the covers the whole ground floor, but the only entrance for the manufacturing space is on the Rockaway side. Correct. Okay. Great. And then I uh, just want to encourage you to uh, reach out to PS41 and the staff that's there to let them know uh, that you're planning on coming and finding ways that you can work with the school directly and to assure them, as well as the parents, that those uh, entities that are, will be on the ground floor will in fact meet your very strict requirements as well as those of the DEP. Because you know Absolutely. that will be a concern. You know, it's a building right across the street where there are children, young children, uh, teenagers, whatever, who are in those buildings. We have a great concern because we know that oftentimes younger children are more susceptible to certain kinds of emissions than, than we older folks, the more mature folks. So thank you for your presentation and thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you very Council much. Over. Yes, did you have something else? Yeah, yeah, I was just gonna jump in and say that um, the existing facility, which is being demolished for our new right. facility, has its loading dock directly across the street from the school. Right where trucks uh, literally parked on a sidewalk and idled. That yes. would be no, there'll be none of that near the school. So in, in, the, in the future, the conditions will be much better for the school, its occupants, the children, the, the professionals in the school than it was in the past because all that activity will take place on Rockaway Avenue um, on a complete diagonal from where it, it formerly took place. So our design from the get-go is a better design for the people who utilize the school. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, I now invite uh, my colleagues to ask questions. Uh, if you have questions for the applicant panel, please use the raise hand button on the applicant panel. Uh, council, are there any council members with questions? Uh, I see no members uh, with hands for questions at this time. Great. Uh, there being no further questions, the panel uh, is excused. Thank you very Council. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on 803 uh, Rockway Avenue rezoning application? Yes, Chair Moya, there are two 
public witnesses who have signed up to speak on this item. Witnesses should please note that once you as a panel have completed your testimony, you will be removed together as a group uh, and you, will, you may continue to view the live stream broadcast of this hearing at the council's website. We will now hear from the first panel, which will include Jennifer Crescatelli and Scott Burton. Jennifer Crescatelli will be the first speaker, followed by Scott Burton. Hi. Thank you. Members of the public will be given uh, two minutes to speak. Uh, please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms has started the clock. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Crescitelli. I'm an AVP with the bridge in the residential services. And I, I thought it was very important to take just two minutes today and tell you a little bit about some of the things that we do for our clients who live in our supported services. Um, the bridge has operated mixed housing before with community residents and our um, Office of Mental Health clients. And I think it's important to understand how we support the folks who are living within the community. Uh, some of the examples of our services that we provide are twice monthly visits from a case manager. One of those visits takes place in the apartment where we do an extensive apartment review for safety and security. Um, also is an opportunity to maybe teach people who need a little bit of help on how to maintain their apartments. We do a lot of work with the community referral sources for psychiatric and medical needs. Um, in this new time of telehealth and telemental health, we make sure that every one of our residents, whether they're in supported or in community housing, have the opportunity to use, utilize our telehealth services and get assistance with that as needed. We focus a lot on individual activities based on the client's needs, but we also do a lot of group work. Um, so we talk about art, writing, wellness, financial services, um, in an effort to make sure that our clients have a little bit more opportunity to have a well-rounded life in their permanent home, um, with the goal always being that we're a good neighbor, that we are part of an active community that wants us to be there, and that we can possibly help fill needs where things are missing. So I appreciate your time this morning, and I thank you for giving me two minutes. Next speaker will be Scott Burton. Time starts now. Good morning, my name is Scott Burton. And first of all, I want to say I appreciate having this opportunity to speak on my behalf and others who are part of the Bridge Program. Um, I been able to live a great life with the bridge housing. I've been with the bridge since 98. And I find that the staff that that I've had helped me are very responsible and respectful, respectful of my needs and the of the residents and community. I currently live in Brooklyn, which is a graduate status. It's beautiful, quiet. I, I get along well with the neighbors and the building is very secure and clean. And any questions that I may have are answered almost immediately. I have no problems with um, with giving along with anyone. I've been here to accomplish many of my goals. Um, and it's been a, a, a very uh, helpful um, environment for me. And I appreciate the staff, like I said, and I um, just want to say that um, I am very satisfied and thank you so much for giving me this time to speak. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, testimony today. Um, are there any council members that have questions for this panel? Here, I see no members with questions for the panel. Great. There being uh, no more questions, uh, there being no questions for uh, this panel, the witness panel is now excused. Um, Council 
uh, is there any other members of the public who wish to testify uh, on the pre-considered LU items for 803 Rockaway Avenue uh, rezoning proposal? Uh, if there is, please raise the raise hand button now. Uh, we will uh, take a moment uh, to check if there's any members of the public uh, who wish to testify on this. Chair Moya, we have no other public witnesses signed up to speak on this item. Thank you. There being no uh, other members of the public who wish to testify on the pre-considered LU items for 803 Rockaway Avenue rezoning application, the public hearing is now closed and the application is laid over. And now we will move to um, 312 Coney Island rezoning. I now open the public hearing on 312 Coney Island Avenue rezoning proposal relating to property in Council Member Landers District in Brooklyn. Uh, the ULERP application numbers for these pre-considered items are C200092 ZMK and N000930ZRK. The application includes a zoning map amendment to change an existing C82 district to an R8A C24 district within the special uh, Ocean Parkway district and a related zoning text amendment to modify setback requirements in an R8A district adjacent to um, Machada Circle, as well as to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option one and two in conjunction with a third related action, which we anticipate taking up, up at a future public hearing. These actions would facilitate the development of a new mixed use building with the approximate height of 14 stories, approximately 278 units, 5,000 square feet of ground floor retail space, and a new 30,000 uh, square foot church facility. Um, at this time, uh, I would like to recognize uh, my colleague, Council Member Lander, um, for a statement. Uh, thank you, Chair Moya. I appreciate your making this opportunity for uh, my constituents and I to participate in this public hearing. Um, you know, obviously, this proposal has been working its way through the land use process, and there's been you know dialogue about it at the community board, at the borough president, at the city planning commission, and we appreciate the opportunity to have dialogue about it here. Um, you know, as so many other of the projects we face, uh, you know, we we. Uh, I think there's some shared goals for achieving uh, affordable housing. In this case, there's obviously a longtime community institution, uh, the church, looking to stay in this uh, community. Um, and we are trying to find ways to do that that fit within the design and community context that uh, its neighbors have lived in for a long, long time as they have really uh, built this, uh, this community up. One of my favorite things about this little area is at one time it had five stables. This was where uh, stables for like the whole borough of Brooklyn and riding in the park took place. One of those stables still exists um, just actually on the same block to addresses down. And we've done a lot of work to preserve those stables and make sure we can continue to have riding in Prospect Park. So that's just one little look at the kind of challenges of preserving what is wonderful about this neighborhood. Um, you know, which is very nearby, quite low rise, you know, one in, in two family, two story homes, um, but also has, you know, the diverse context of the circle um, and other uses nearby. So we're going to do our best to navigate through this. What I want to do today is just hear from the applicants. I have a few questions and then I really want to listen to community members who are here so that we can make the best possible uh, decision on this application. Thank you. At, thank you. Uh, at this time, I would also like to remind the viewing public uh, that the council is providing a live stream broadcast of this meeting with uh, ASL interpretation, which could be found on the council's website at www.council.nyc.gov backslash live stream. And with that, uh, council, if you can please call the first panel for this item. The applicant panel for this item will include uh, Zach Bernstein, Land Youth Counsel for the applicant, Morris Jerome, Ray Kazis, 
Dan Kaplan, uh, project architect. Also appearing for this item and available for questions uh, will be Wesley O'Brien, uh, Ellen Lehman, both counsel to the applicant, and Tom Snyder, uh, also with the architect. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request so that you may begin to speak. Council, if you could uh, please administer uh, the affirmation. Panelists, uh, if you would please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, uh, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes. I do. Yes. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are in receipt of your uh, slideshow presentation for this proposal. Uh, when you're ready to present it, uh, please just say so, and it will be displayed on screen uh, for you by our staff. The slides will be advanced for you when you say next. Please note that there may be a slight delay in both the initial loading and advancing of the slides. As a reminder, members of the public needing uh, an accessible version of this presentation are asked to please send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, and now panelists, if you could just please state your name and affirmation for the record. And with that, uh, we may begin. Good morning, Chair Moya and council members. I'm Zachary Bernstein with Freed Frank Land Use Council. To the applicant, I'm, uh, we are ready to, to present the presentation. This is an application to facilitate redevelopment of 312 Coney Island Avenue with a new church and school for the International Baptist Church as part of an MIH development providing approximately 70 new units of affordable housing. The applicant is an affiliate of JEMB Realty, which holds a ground lease under which it will serve as developer of the site. The property is owned by the International Baptist Church. Here with me to present is Morris Jerome, a principal of the applicant, as well as Ray Kazis, pastor of the church. I will give Morris and the pastor a moment to introduce themselves. Next slide, please. Morris Jerome will speak. Good morning, council members. I'm here today representing JEMB Realty, a third generation family owned real estate company that was founded by my grandfather, Morris Bailey in 1980. Our firm prides itself on long-term ownership of our assets, as well as community engagement with all the assets that we own and develop. We have had success throughout our portfolio in incorporating community facilities in our assets. One example being 75 Broad Street in downtown Manhattan, which is home to the first post 9-11 high school known as Millennium High School. Next slide, please. As a lifelong Brooklyn resident, I am very proud of the fact that we are nearing completion of the first modern office building in downtown Brooklyn, known as One Willoughby Square. This project was a collaboration between the New York EDC and the School Construction Authority, which is going to provide a 300 seat public school at the base of the building. In addition to that, while building out the FX Fowl floors, office floors, we are successful in having an over 35% MWBE contractor participation and anticipate rolling that out throughout the building as the space is being fit out. We had a great experience with Dan Kaplan who was here with us today and have engaged with him to be the architect of record for this all important corner on Prospect Park. We have worked with city planning as well as, well as the council member to provide a design that we, we feel we should all be proud of. It brings much needed affordable housing to the area and provides the long-term viability of the church and school facility. Now here, we have Pastor Ray Cruz who will share our mutual goals for the project. Next slide, Ray Cruz will now take over. Good morning, uh, council, council members. Uh, my name is Ray Casas, and I've been the pastor of the International Baptist Church since 2008. Uh, I've had the privilege of raising my family uh, here in the Windsor Terrace neighborhood, and it's a great community. Uh, we are a Baptist congregation, and our church is a diverse community which conducts services in three languages, 
Our membership includes about 30 nationalities. A part of our ministry is a K through 12 school with about approximately 85 students. Well, it was an, a number of years ago, we started to plan for our future and we are glad that we found JEMB Realty uh, who will be ground leasing the property and giving back to us uh, an, a new and improved church and school. They share our vision of how a new development will be a positive addition to our neighborhood. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak this morning. Now back to Zach Bernstein. Thank you, Pastor. Next slide, please. Here's an image of a site located within the CA2 zoning district along Coney Island Avenue. The CA2 district does not allow residential use. It allows commercial use and a limited set of community facility uses. The applicant seeks the following action. A zoning map amendment would rezone the site from CA2 to R8A with a C24 overlay. This will facilitate a 7.2 FAR mixed building with new church and school facilities, local retail, and apartments above. The project would be a mandatory inclusionary housing development under option one, which requires 25% of the residential floor area to be affordable on average at 60% of the area median income with at least 10% affordable at 40% of AMI. Rent for these apartments will start at $535 per month at the 40% AMI level and $856 per month at the 60% level. A zoning text amendment to the Special Ocean Parkway District would permit the street wall to rise without setback on the project's wide street, allowing for a lower height transition from the neighboring R7A district. Our project architect will speak further to this. And a proposed special permit modifies residential accessory parking rules, allowing for a portion of the parking spaces to be utilized by the church on Sundays. Next slide, please. Because the CA2 district does not allow residential use, the only recent private development in the CA2 has been hotel or self-storage uses. That has shaped the context around this site. Here's a photo that I took recently of the new CubeSmart building that now sits right next to our site. Next slide, please. Among the objectives of MI8 is promotion of neighborhood economic diversity to give lower income New Yorkers access to the services, amenities, schools, and social networks available in neighborhoods with greater resources. Despite that intention, MIH rezonings to date have been largely in low income communities. The site, this site presents an opportunity to leverage MIH in an amenity rich neighborhood. Median income in Windsor Terrace is near six figures. 312 Coney Island Avenue is a model of the type of site that is appropriate for increased density under MIH. In addition to its proximity to Prospect Park, which you can see right across Machate Circle here, the site sits directly across from the tennis courts and football, baseball, and soccer fields of the parade grounds. It is also touched by numerous bike, bus, and transit routes. With the proposed zoning, the project would create approximately 70 permanently affordable apartments, providing lower income families with access to these resources. The community board recommended disapproval of the zoning change primarily based on objections to the height permitted in the R8A district. The borough president recommended approval with a condition that the height be lowered adjacent to the R7A district. The city planning commission discussed these recommendations and then voted unanimously to approve the application, concluding that the proposed height and design approach are appropriate at this location and that a reduction was not worth a loss of affordable housing units. Next slide, please. The proposal before you today is the result of extensive dialogue with the Department of City Planning and Council Member Lander. Here on the screen is the original proposal from the church and the applicant, which would have rebuilt only a portion of the site with greater height along Park Circle and leaving the existing school building in place. With the encouragement of Council Member Lander, we reached agreement to design a new school to be incorporated as part of a more contextual envelope across the site. The new church and school together with the 70 MIH units, will occupy 35% of the new building. I now turn the presentation to Dan Kaplan of Epex Collaborative to walk you through how the project evolved from here. Next slide, please. 
Thank you, Zach. Uh, I'm Dan Kaplan, a senior partner at FX Collaborative Architects. Before taking you through the design, I wanna point out that this is a rare site that fronts on three wide streets, ranging from nearly 100 feet wide to almost 500 feet wide, plus the park space and the parade space, parade ground space beyond. The single narrow street on the south of the site is even wider than most at 70 feet. Next slide. The slide that's coming up illustrates two unique conditions of this development. First, the special district requires a 30 foot front setback along Ocean Parkway. While a typical block is, is 200 feet deep, we're starting off with a, with a block that's narrower at 180 feet. Second, you can see in purple here that the project incorporates 40,000 gross square feet of church and school program, including a double height chapel, uh, which effectively lifts the, the residential building higher in the air. Further, the residential amenities and other functions that might've been below grade are, are pushed up into the building because of, of the church program. Incorporating these uses into the residential base substantially increases the cost and complexity of, of the project. Next slide, please. When we mass the residential floors above this base, um, at the request of uh, Council Member Lander, we sought to create a transition area from the R7A district. Illustrated here in lighter yellow is where the bulk from the western portions of the site has been shifted to the full street wall along the circle. The result is a strong architectural presence that frames the circle consistent with other park circles like Grand Army uh, Plaza, which I'll show you in a moment. To respect the context of the adjacent R7A district, we have designed the building incorporating a four-story transition towards the center of the block. However, at the confluence of the three wide streets where the op large open space is, I suggest this is exactly and precisely where increased density and height ought to be. Uh, next slide, please. Taking cues from the historic fabric of the area, we propose to add notches into the form of the building to break it up uh, into smaller components. Next. Now I have uh, six renderings, which I'll walk through uh, quickly. Um, this slide, this aerial shows uh, the building presence on the circle surrounded by, by the open area. Next. Uh, this view, it's up. Yeah, Th this view we show how the street wall frames a large open space uh, of Park Circle. Next, which will be a zoom in into the base of the building that shows a uh, pedestrian view of the Park Circle frontage. Uh, really, the first two floors are the church and the school that have complete frontage along uh, Park Circle and, and down um, Coney Island Avenue. The church facility is integrated into the rest of the building and not a freestanding or separate element. Next slide, please. The slide that's coming up is a view from Ocean Parkway. And it shows the transition from the R7A district on the right and use it and the use of the notches uh, to break down the scale into vertical components. Next slide, please. The slide that's coming up is a view from Caton Place looking uh, east, showing the transition up from the R7A on the left to the uh, parade grounds on the right. Next slide, please. The idea of a clear, simple form rising directly from grade to cornice without setback is consistent with the other well-loved buildings that line uh, the other park circles of Prospect Park. Here are some along Grand Armory Plaza. They create a strong spatial definition of the circle and a clear demarcation between the park and, and the urban fabric. Next, please. Here is our, con well, which as it comes up, we're gonna show you the ground floor plan that organizes multiple programs. Uh, first in purple is the church, uh, again, with its frontage along Park Circle and Coney Island Avenue and wrapping on Ocean Parkway. Um, 
the, the main entrance to the building in shown uh, the residential component shown in yellow is on Ocean Parkway uh, along uh, Caton Place it will be uh, the school entry, uh, as well as neighborhood oriented retail use, um, uh, uh, bike storage and entrance to the parking, there'll be 140 bike parking spaces. Next slide, please. Finally, in the seller plan, we are able to fit approximately 80 spaces. 36 of these spaces would be available to church congregants on Sundays to replace the existing surface parking on the site. I will now turn it back over to Zach to wrap up. Thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dan. Next slide. So the team here today worked hard with the Department of City Planning and Council Member Lander on a thoughtful proposal for this site. The proposal implements MIH in an area rich in amenities, provides an anchor for the community with new church and school facilities, all in a package of thoughtful architecture for this prominent location on the circle. We welcome your questions. Thank you, one second, please. Council Member Lander, I see you've changed your background from uh, a map like mine to uh, what looks like this location. So uh, like Park <laughs> Circle or Machate Circle, as it's called, was the right place to do this hearing. <laughs> Good. So before uh, I ask uh, some questions and turn it over to Council Member Lander, uh, just to facilitate the uh, question and answer period. If one of you, uh, perhaps Mr. Uh, Bernstein, you could uh, keep your mic open for the duration and let us know who on the team might be in uh, a position to uh, best address the specific questions as they come up. Will do. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, can you just explain the rationale for uh, the mapping uh, of both the MIH options one and two when the application states that they intend to utilize only option one? Um, there's a requirement, I believe, to map the optionality, um, but the intention is to, is to move ahead with option one. And what tenants uh, use uh, have you considered for the proposed ground floor um, commercial space? One thing that's been thought about is a, is a green grocer here. Um, the, the, I think the nearest grocery is a small is the small Windsor Terrace food co-op a few blocks away, um, but we haven't had conversations with specific tenants yet. Um, we ha have heard consistently that there's a lack of local neighborhood services here and are open to suggestions for what might serve the needs of area residents because there's there's just not much in the vicinity right now. Great. And can you just describe your plans uh, for outreach to MWBEs and locally based contractors and subcontractors for this uh, development? Sure. I'll, I'll let uh, Morris Jerome take that if someone can unmute him. Hi. Um, for MWBE participation, we work with a firm called Crescent. Uh, we work with them in downtown Brooklyn. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we were successful in a 35% participation uh, with interior fit out work. Um, that translates into over 70 uh, people working within those floors. Um, and uh, we intend to retain them as well for this project. Thank you. And can you just describe your plans for local hiring and also what's going to be the ongoing reporting on those plans? Uh, local hiring um, as far as construction or is, is that your question? Yes. Uh, well, construction, we're gonna be doing open shop, which is what we've done at uh, Willoughby, uh, which really uh, becomes a mix of union and non-union contractors. Um, pretty successful harmony there. Um, we've engaged 32PJ, um, who will be uh, performing the services at the building once it's built. And, um, you know, we've, uh, in downtown Brooklyn, we complied with all of the ICAP requirements uh, with Crescent on the MWBE side, and we intend to be doing that here as well, so. Great. 
Thank you very much. Um, I now want to turn it over to uh, Councilmember Lander for some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Moy. I appreciate your, you know, your support and your questions on behalf of our community. Um, um, so, you know, a few questions for the team, and you know, I appreciate that you've been in dialogue with my office and with the community for for quite some time here, as you say. And you know, there are, you know, uh, some of the things I appreciate about this proposal. You know, I think obviously uh, providing the the street wall in the way that you've done it here, working with the church to enable them to stay, incorporating the MIH. Um, are all good. And I certainly share, you know, broadly the idea that this circle is an appropriate place uh, for residential development, a lot better than the uh, Cube Smart that is next door. We don't need any more self storage facilities. Um, uh, you know, and that therefore a rezoning of some kind is warranted. I guess I do want to ask about the R8A district and how you think about the rationale. Uh, for that, you know, there is other residential development on the circle at, you know, at significantly lower heights. And, you know, we did a rezoning on the immediately adjacent site to 7A, um, you know, and the 7.2 and the 14 stories are both, you know, higher than the surrounding context, even on the rest of the circle itself. Um, and I, I just, you know, wonder, I mean, you obviously, you know, gave some of the rationale from the other corners of the park, but I think it's worth asking in terms of, you know, the immediate context where, you know, folks live um, nearby, what's the rationale for mapping, uh, for mapping this district? Sure. I mean, a number of factors went into planning what we thought was best for this site to achieve a number of goals, um, both looking at what could be built as of right, as a, as a touch point for penciling out a new development that then has to include MIH in it and also trying to meet the needs of the church um, of getting its new facilities. Um, and then when we had to shift course and, and uh, agreed to demolish the existing school building and build brand new school facilities and increasing the capacity of the school within the project, um, it, it all has to pencil out and be a feasible project. And, and so a lot of hard work went into what mix and what density results in a feasible project. Um, and, and working with the city administration, we're also trying to maximize the goals of housing affordability under MIH. So all, all those together um, went into the proposal we have here today. I think what happens to be built um, next door doesn't necessarily control what is appropriate for a given location. And this is uh, a, a, as Dan said, a very rare location on uh, approximately 500 feet of open area, even before you get to the park. And urban planning principles of, of the Department of City Planning, when they study zoning, uh, emphasize the location for density in in these types of places. And you know, while um, the 13 stories here seems may seem tall compared to some things that are in the area. And compared to other projects that are happening around Brooklyn, this is a, a, a pretty modest project. All right. I mean, I, I'm interested to hear, you know, I'll be listening to, to the testimony from folks in the in the neighborhood as well. Uh, you know, I, I, I like to see the church get, you know, its resources and what it needs. And, and I agree affordable housing is a goal, but I'm not sure. Um, and I think more, you know, more density than is allowed by the, you know, than is allowed by the zoning and obviously more residential density that's allowed by the zoning are all warranted. I don't know that the answer, you know, it feels like implicit in what you're saying is like, this is out of context, um, but the other goals are more important and that's challenging. You've got a set of people who move to this neighborhood loving its context and how do, this is the hard thing our council always weighs. You know, we want we want the affordable housing. We want to support the the church. We think this is an appropriate location for density, um, but also we we try to give some uh, recognition and respect to the idea that neighborhoods also have character and people move there for yeah. them. And that balance is is what we're working on today. So I guess you know both Community Board Seven and the Brooklyn Borough President. Um, recommended some changes to, you know, an upzoning for sure, significantly more density and especially residential density than is allowed today, um, but, but modified from and somewhat less than what you're proposing. 
um, you know, do, can you respond to the recommendations that the community board and the borough president made? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll say two things to that. I mean, one, I just want to give a little reality check on the context. Coney Island Avenue is a major avenue um, with, as you noted, uh, and, and I guess unfortunately, the Cube Smart next door, a, a tall residential building, which was a BSA variant next to it, another older storage alongside. Um, so, you know, this, this is not, Coney Island Avenue is not a quaint avenue. But, um, you know, I, I live around here. I give credence to um, some, of, some of those concerns. And um, we tried to work hard, at least on the transition between the R7A and the R8A. Um, and perhaps it's something that we can look closer at going forward because we, you know, we, we have been sensitive to that all along that drove the zoning proposal and it's a relatively large site. And so there may be things we could continue to study on the architecture that um, give a feeling that this, this does blend in a little bit more as it meets the rest of the neighborhood. And, and I'll just, I appreciate your, that response. And I, you know, I'll just say, look, it definitely would be better if we were rezoning a stretch of Coney Island Avenue here, it would be better if we had done that before. So instead of the Cube Smart, we had gotten, you know, a kind of mixed retail and residential development next door. And if we were gonna, you know, apply a new context stretched all down Coney Island Avenue in a way that, you know, felt more like the community engaging with city planning, it's not your responsibility to have done that. Um, you know, but I think it's worth flagging part of the challenge of these processes is rather than having a community dialogue about what the context should be and how that balances the goals appropriately in a case where all the goals of affordability and commercial character and context could be weighed equally, we wind up, you know, responding to individual developer actions, which is again, not your fault, but not an optimal way to be doing it. Um, uh, I just want to ask about parking uh, for a minute. And obviously on this site, you have both the, uh, you know, new residential development, but you also have the church and, and some people live nearby, but, but plenty of people will be coming from other places. And so can you just um, go over for me, how many parking spaces would be required without the waiver that you're requesting? How many parking spaces would be required with the waiver that you're requesting and, and what your rationale is? Yeah, so without the waiver, approximately 80 spaces are required, give or take, based on the residential density. Um, th we are providing approximately 80 spaces, um, but want the flexibility to have some of those spaces available for the church, particularly on Sundays. The church parking lot today, which is an open parking lot, has 36 spaces, and so the plan is to have 36 swing spaces available on Sundays, which would be you know, sort of transitory spaces during the week and, and made available on the weekends to um, church members who need to drive in. Um, you know, we're exploring having car share in some of the other spaces uh, so as to discourage car ownership by residents of the building. And um, you know, although we're in a strange time right now with COVID where people aren't trusting transit uh, sometimes, although I, I am certainly riding the subway myself and, and came to work today on the Q train, um, you know, the, the policies out of the administration and the city council have been to decrease um, private car ownership. And I think part of doing that is not having lots and lots of spaces available in every new building. Um, all right, uh, thank you uh, for those answers. And yeah, I think Mr. Chair, that concludes the question. I mean, I guess I'm maybe reserve, reserve the reserve the ability to come back and ask more questions later. I think actually on the parking, um, just so folks, the, 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 you said this at the beginning, but technically this is actually not the public hearing on the, on the parking waiver, uh, the way that the, the calendar works from city planning, that one was like trailing behind it. So we can take comments on it today. That's why I asked about it here, but we will also actually later on have to have formally. Uh, so there's some room that we can consider further asking some of these questions later there if we need to. But, um, but that concludes my questions and I look forward to hearing the public testimony on the site. Thank you. Uh, I now invite uh, any of my colleagues to ask questions. If you have questions for the applicant panel, uh, please use the raise hand button on the uh, participant panel. Uh, Council, are there any members uh, with questions? Mr. Moya, uh, I see no members with questions for the panel. Great. There being no further questions, the panel uh, is now excused. 
uh, council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the Coney Island Avenue uh, rezoning items? Thank you, Chair Moya. Uh, there are approximately 30 public witnesses who have signed up to speak on this uh, item. For members of the public here to testify, please note again that witness panels will be called in groups of up to four names per panel. If you are a member of the public who has signed up to testify on the pre-considered LU items for the Coney Island Avenue rezoning, and as you hear your name being called, please stand by and prepare to speak when the chair recognizes you to do so. Please also note that once all panelists in your group have completed their testimony, you will be removed as a group uh, and the next group of speakers will be introduced. After you have completed your testimony and your group has been removed, uh, you may view the live stream broadcast of this hearing at the council's website. We will now hear from the first panel, which will include Harry Bubbins, Virginia Cahill, Danette Plagg, and Jeannie Hutchins. <laughs> the first speaker will be Harry Bubbins, followed by Virginia Cahill. Thank you, Arthur. Um, and to the members of the public, uh, just a reminder that you will be given two minutes to speak. Uh, please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms has started the clock. And now uh, the first panelists, you may begin. Time starts now. Respect Brooklyn opposes the luxury up zoning of 312 Coney Allen Avenue, Aka 11 Ocean Parkway. It has 29 open violations and a stop work order. The lobbying firms here also represented the controversial Amazon relocation and the defeated industry city rezoning and have already received over $300,000 for this ill-considered luxury up zoning. Their employees also donate money to citywide campaigns and that undercuts public confidence in the transparency of this process. This proposal would be more than twice as tall as adjacent buildings and have 300% more luxury units than so-called affordable. You can guarantee that the multi-million dollar penthouse units raised even higher by this grandiose upzoning overlooking the park will not be part of the paltry MIH component. The developer here has signed a 99 year lease that is worth a billion dollars and the threats to build an as of right hotel instead of a contextual residence is divisive and delusional. The design is unchanged since the community board disapproval. They have not listened to or involved the community at all. Affordable housing is welcome. Out of touch spot zonings are not. The mayor's real estate friendly approach is a failure. Pandemic up zonings from Gowanus to Flatbush while the mayor is going out the door are harmful and shameful. Nothing is stopping them from developing a 100% affordable housing development except for the coveting of more money. Without seeing the financials, you cannot make an informed decision. You just heard the Rockaway proposal that was 50-50 and contextual. The proposed Tower of Babel at a very significant and prominent location would have a detrimental impact upon the character of the area and lead to displacement pressures in Flatbush. It is a gross mirror image of the luxury one Grand Army Plaza. We need community planning, not precedent setting luxury spot up zonings during a pandemic that benefit and profit a tiny few. We call upon the council to reject all three elements of this proposed luxury spot up zoning and engage in real community planning. Thank you. Thank you, Harry, for your testimony. Next speaker is Virginia Cahill. Time starts now. Hi, thank you for this opportunity to um, make a testimony. I uh, live on Park Circle. This is right outside my window. It's an extremely busy artery for trucks, cars, ambulances. The traffic here is already insane. My grandson and I can tell what time it is by the honking. It starts at 3.30. I try to make it friendly and say, here comes the honk fest. It's so painful. It's congested in the immediate area, even adding a few cars to this circle is hard to imagine. I've been on Ocean Parkway for 18 years. Parking has become so difficult and it's not gonna get any better. 
with 36 parking spots. <clears throat> this isn't a run of the mill area. This is really unique and development should reflect or at least consider the density of the neighborhood. Our community surrounds Prospect Park. High rise buildings are incongruous with the area. There is a lot of foot traffic, bicycles and horses. That's why we love it. This is a, a beautiful neighborhood. More people equals more cars, less parking, but mostly more noise and traffic. I implore the developers to keep this within scale of the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you for your testimony today. Next speaker will be Dennis Plage, Plage, followed by Jeannie Hutchins. Time begins now. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I'm also a resident of the neighborhood. Um, I really find it troubling that what's being spoken about is that this project is being compared to the Cube Smart that went up on Coney Island Avenue. This is not reflective of what the neighborhood actually is and has been historically. And to use that as a mile marker seems completely inappropriate. I also want to address the parking issues. The developers have continually cited about car shares. We all know that the one car share agency that Brooklyn had, which was Zipcar, is no longer here. So car share is not really even an option, which means that parking will become more difficult. I agree with my neighbor. The congested traffic here is unbearable and has only gotten worse so over the past years. I also am a parent. I live in the building across the street from this site and work in the school, which is approximately two blocks away. The developers have been not transparent and have not involved the community in this. And I really would prefer to see something, some sort of building that is more to scale. The building that I live in is the largest building in the neighborhood and it's, not, it's six stories high. What's being proposed is over double that and seems completely incongruous with the neighborhood. And it doesn't create enough affordable housing, which is desperately needing, needed. I want to address the school issue. While the school is a new building, and um, it, it's already completely overcrowded. It has four to five classes per grade with 35 students per class. I, as a teacher, know that it's almost impossible to move within those classrooms because they're so crowded. None of this addresses, none of these infrastructure issues with adding this amount of housing expired. will address that issue. And I'll yield at this point. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. The last speaker on the panel is Jeannie Hutchins. Time begins now. Hello. Yes, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I echo the other people's objections and I have lived here for 20 years and I have noticed the increase in congestion and traffic and so forth. Um, but mostly I just feel that the bulk of this building is absurd and it's an assault on our neighborhood. I mean, there's first of all, no way we can sustain it, but also to justify it by looking at Grand Army Plaza buildings, which are not as near, they're older, they're farther away. This is a very bulky building and it's very close to the park and it's more akin to the horrible building on Ocean Avenue across the way that brings tears to my eyes every time I enter the park. It's such an assault. So just from the standpoint of the visual aesthetics and the park itself, it's an abomination to put a building like this at the park circle, at the Machate circle. Um, the other thing is that I do feel like the first few people today in this hearing, which, were, which was very interesting, um, were very aware of their development's connection to the community. They had considered all kinds of things in their plans. They were considering the schools, they were considering the a traditional architecture, none of that seems to have come into consideration with the exception of a few parapet indicators and maybe some brick. We live in six or seven story buildings. The 
prospect of this huge building that's twice as high right across the street is, is horrifying to most of us. It's totally out of proportion and it does not reek, it does not read affordable housing. When you look at this plan, it does not look like, oh great, they're putting up affordable housing. It is the farthest thing from that. And I think affordable housing and MIH and all of that is far more in keeping with what we'd like than a tower like this with a luxury look. And we would like, to, the community would like to be involved in every inch of the way on the planning and this sort of random wild west spot rezoning is totally inappropriate. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you for the testimony. Uh, council, do we have uh, any council members uh, that have questions for this panel? Oh, Chair Maya, no, uh, I see no hands uh, from members for this panel. There being no questions for this panel, the panel is now excused. Council, if you can please call up the next panel. The next panel will include Cassandra Carrillo, Christopher Kazis, Jesus Ramos, and Saber Mostafa. First speaker will be Cassandra Carrillo, followed by Christopher Kazis. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, I'm here now. Hi, um, good morning, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name is Cassie Garrillo and I'm a representative of 32BJ. I'm here today on behalf of my union and the more than 1132BJ members who live um, and or work in Community District 7 to share our support for this project. 32BJ supports responsible development, development that takes into consideration workers, working families, and the needs of local community. We believe that projects like this should come with credible commitments to prevailing wage jobs for building service workers and local hire. I'm pleased to announce that the developers for this project have made a credible commitment to provide prevailing wage building service jobs at the site. We estimate that this development will bring about 10 new building service jobs to the neighborhood. These jobs will be good jobs that pay family sustaining wages for local essential workers. And for these reasons, we respectfully urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker will be Christopher Kazis. Time begins now. Hello, Council and Councilman Lander. Uh, my name is Christopher Kazis. I am a longtime resident of the 39th District and have the privilege now also living here with my wife and two children for the past six years at 308 Vanderbilt Street. As a resident who knows the area and this property very well, I want to voice my support for the approval of the rezoning of 312 Coney Island Avenue. I know others testifying today will focus on benefit of affordable units. Uh, we also should keep in mind that there's an overall housing shortage in New York City. Our housing supply is growing slower than in a few of our other larger cities in this nation. This proposal brings both affordable housing and new housing, both of which are rare in the community. I also like the fact that a luxury style building will include affordable housing. I don't see that affordable housing should not look luxury. Uh, the size of this building is appropriate for the Circle and Coney Island Avenue. There is a new self-storage building rising almost to the equivalent of an 11-story residential building right behind this site. There's also a 16-story apartment building about four blocks from the proposed property development. The parkfront is a beautiful place that needs new development. I appreciate the thoughtful design and consideration from the developer for our neighborhood. I have seen the renderings and believe the building will complement the Park Circle. It's close proximity to the subway and Prospect Expressway place this development in a great area with easy in and out access to the city. I would also like to add that the size and design of this building will be a nice mask for that very large storage building behind it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker on the panel will be Jesus Ramos to be followed by Saber Mustafa. Time starts now. Hi, good morning, if you can hear me. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jesus Ramos, and I've been living at 734 East 5th Street since uh, 2014. And I know the area well, since uh, two of my children graduated from the school there. I fully support this rezoning because it would allow a property at 312 Coney Island Avenue like no other. 
I know many here don't like the height proposal and will say the other nearby circles don't have similar building structures, but please consider this. It will allow for 70 affordable residential units that many will be able to take advantage of considering how expensive it is to live in New York City, especially in these trying times. I believe it will also be a huge benefit for the neighborhood having a rebuilt school and church in the area, which can even be used for community meetings or special events, and many in the area can benefit from this. So please consider the advantages of this project, uh, which I believe greatly uh, outweigh the alternatives. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for your testimony today. Final speaker on this panel will be Faber Moscato. Time starts now. Yes, hi. I've been a resident for 25 years in Windsor Terrace, and I live nearby the circle as well. I would like to thank everyone involved in this wonderful development. It's nice to see my neighbors get involved in our community. I'd like to say, share some facts about this development. When it gets approved, we are going to be just fine as a community. In fact, it will complement our community. Let me share with you some positive notes about this wonderful de development. This will be a welcoming structure to Windsor Terrace, to everyone and anything that's coming into Windsor Terrace. Creating jobs. Keep in mind, we do need more jobs right now with unemployment rates. In the beginning, construction workers, electricians, plumbers, painters, etc. At completion, maintenance workers, doorman, doorman and staff. Third, low income housing, 70 units, essential for this development and the community. Parking, 80 cars, no loss of parking. I, I find plenty parking in the area when I need it. Community facility, the project allows the church and the school to remain essential to the community and the development. Commercial stores. For 25 years, I've heard my neighbors and myself talk about more stores, more restaurants, more supermarkets, essential in this development. Hopefully a nice big supermarket will come in. In closing, for many years, as I said earlier, we've wished for a project like this. And now we have someone who wants to do it. This development meets all our needs. Please keep in mind the people that live on the building on the circle. A hundred years ago, when they built this building, if they didn't build it, we wouldn't have those buildings now. I'm expired. For people to enjoy them. Please approve this project. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, that being the last speaker on the panel, um, Council, do we have any council members uh, with questions for this panel? There are seen no members with questions for the panel. Thank you. Uh, there being no more questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. Council, can you please call up the next panel? The next panel will include Joy Rosenthal, Cynthia Spencer, Mac Montandon, and Prudence Hill. First speaker will be Joy Rosenthal, followed by Cynthia Spencer. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Joy Rosenthal. I reside at 30 Ocean Parkway. Before this, I lived at 71 Ocean Parkway. I've lived in the neighborhood for about 18 years um, and I'm very, very familiar with it. What's not being said is that this is bordered on one side by a ramp to the highway, on another side by Coney Island Avenue, which is a major artery. Um, and then on two sides by very small streets, uh, East 8th Street and Caton Place, which already have seen the development of three huge apartment houses in the last few years, as well as the Cube Smart that's been referenced. Um, the, other, uh, the other facility on this very block is the, the 
stables, which has been squeezed um, since I've lived here. It's gone from two buildings to one and provides the only horses for Prospect Park, which are a huge part of the character of this neighborhood. Um, because of this particular configuration being across from the police task force and Prospect Park and, and the parade grounds being, and then on, on one side and on two other sides being um, surrounded by the, the ramps to the highway, uh, there's very, very little parking here. My husband was disabled and parking was always a huge problem. We needed the car because of his disability. We could not use public, he was not able to use public transportation and um, parking is already horrendous on both sides of, of Ocean Parkway of, of the highway. Um, this will create a huge inconvenience and 80 parking spaces is absolutely not enough. In addition, the having it be 13 feet high is really an imposition and um, I would encourage that if there's going to be any development that it be eight stories high in, in con conjunction with the rest of the neighborhood. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Joy. Thank you for your testimony today. Next speaker will be Cynthia Spencer followed by Mac Montandon. Time starts now. Thank you. I appreciate the time to speak. Um, I'm a resident of the neighborhood also, and I walk by this location and also ride my bicycle by it uh, almost daily, going to the park and other areas. Uh, I've always loved going by the existing property and always appreciated the green lawn and seeing the room to play and the sunlight being able to reach the sidewalks. And I think it's so important to preserve that character of the places that we uh, walk through, transition through. Um, I'm also, I'm, I'm particularly concerned and I haven't heard anyone talk about um, the impacts that there might be on the existing bike paths along the Ocean Parkway side. Um, so I would like to um, ask that more information be provided about that. Um, if they're already, you know, I mean, as they are there, uh, they could use uh, further improvement, but at least they, they serve a very valuable and important function in allowing people to get safely to the park. Um, and since it's going right by that uh, place, I'm, I'm wondering whether there will be any impact and I hope that uh, uh, it will be improved and not reduced. Um, that area of the park and the parade ground is very much people's link to nature at this, especially at this time of pandemic, but really all the time. Um, I would also like to say that I, uh, while I appreciate that some work has been done on trying to make it more conducive to the neighborhood, I still think that the you know, having more setback and adjustment to the sizing is necessary to keep it within the character of the neighborhood. Uh, from what I can see of these photos or the uh, renderings, it still looks very large and monolithic on the park side. And um, I think that the comparisons to Grand Army Plaza don't make sense because this is a very different situation, doesn't really uh, fit into the character. So I think that much more work should be done on that. Uh, I certainly echo all the statements previously made about concerns about parking and the effect on streets and whether, you know, affects- I'm inspired. Sports. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker will be Mac Montandon followed by Prudence Hill. Time starts now. Hello, uh, good afternoon to the subcommittee and council members. Thank you very much for hosting this today. Um, you'll not understand why the dog's here in a second. Uh, so in a couple of weeks on December 1st, my wife Catherine and I will celebrate uh, the 17th anniversary of when we moved into Windsor Terrace. At the time of when we moved in, Catherine was six months pregnant with our older first child and oldest daughter. Her sister was born about two and a half years after that. And this is the only home, community, and neighborhood that our kids have ever known. They've grown up here. They've frolicked in Prospect Park nearly every day. Um, you know, their only real complaint growing up was that we lived in an apartment building and didn't have a backyard. Um, so they couldn't get a dog. Um, but at a certain point, we just started telling them that their backyard was Prospect Park. And um, they took to that eventually. 
and went up off on their own when they were old enough to play in their backyard at Prospect Park. I mentioned all of this today because at the top of his presentation, Mr. Jerome talked about how his firm is a family business, uh, that he's a lifelong Brooklyn resident. And so I'm hoping to appeal to him on both of those levels. Um, and as you've heard from other residents of the neighborhood today, this development has brought a lot of anxiety and a lot of unhappiness to our community and neighborhood. And I would just hope that they would reflect on that and work harder to develop something that is embraced by the entire community. I recognize that they've done a lot of work getting to the point they're at now, but much of that I'm work- inspired. Is that it? You can wrap it up. Oh, you can. I was just gonna say much of their work began pre-pandemic and now that we're in the pandemic and eventually we'll be living in a post-pandemic world, I think coming together as a community is more important than ever and that should be considered uh, in the decision, whatever decisions made about this development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mac. Last speaker on this panel will be Prudence Hill. Time starts now. I'm here. We can hear you, Prudence, whenever can you're you ready. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, all right. Well, I wanted to say that um, I think there's not enough affordable housing. I don't know why it's being said that this is the one of the great advantages of this building because 75% um, of the apartments are going to be luxury housing. And that's not what our neighborhood needs. And it will ensure that gentrification already underway will explode. Um, my husband and I moved here 15 years ago. We live in one of the biggest buildings, which is six stories high. And uh, we could afford it 15 years ago, but uh, we're both school uh, teachers and professors in the public New York, New York City systems. And we could not afford to buy an apartment here now. So if we were to have all this more luxury uh, residents moving in, they're gonna bring more cars and, and it's going to be, and, and the gentrification will explode through the roof. So um, instead of an outsized zo uh, spot zoning development, we would like to see, or I would like to see community-based planning that would take into account the need for diversity, our di desire for diversity, uh, adequate schools, public transportation, grocery stores, health services, et cetera, all the infrastructure that would be needed for this large uh, group of people that will be moving in. Um, as a former public school teacher and a strong proponent of reducing class size, I just want to address one of those issues, which is, will there be enough schools? I don't think there are now. And the, I don't Time know expired. Gonna, oh, well. Prudence, you can wrap it up in, if you can in a couple of seconds. Go ahead. Yeah, well, um, they're probably already overcrowded. In fact, I thought, and, and it'll just be more more overcrowding of our public schools. And I don't have the time now to explain to you what that actually looks like when you have an overcrowded classroom and you have kids with special needs and kids who don't speak English or whatever language they need to speak all crowded together in one small room. It does not affect their education in a good way. Thank you, Prudence. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, that being our last uh, speaker on the panel, uh, council, uh, do we have any council members with questions for this panel? Uh, Chair, I see no members with questions for this panel. Thank you. There being no questions uh, for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. Thank you very much for uh, coming here and giving your testimony today. Council, if you can please call up the next panel.
The next panel will include Forrest Girl, Ronald Longhofer, Valerie Coolborn, and Yvette Bennett. First speaker will be Forrest Girl, followed by Ronald Longhofer. Starting time. Arthur, who do we have up? The first speaker is Forrest Girl, who I do see in the panelist list. Forrest, if you can hear us, you're up. Okay, perhaps we're having an audio issue with... Hi, my name is Forrest Girl. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you, Forrest. Hi, my name's Forrest Girl. I live at 62 East 5th Street. I've been a resident of this neighborhood for about 40 years. First, I'd like to thank the Chair Moyer and uh, Councilman Lander and all the participants of today's hearing for joining and becoming uh, coming together as a community. I am for this project because I'm a community, the community needs it. We need jobs, we need affordable housing, we need a community space where we can gather. We can gather for AA meetings, NA meetings, addiction meetings, just community meetings. So socially, yes, it's gonna be a nice place. And we also need a good church. The church has been there for years. I know Pastor Ray for about 25 years. I lived across the street from them and they've only been an asset to our community. Not just our community, Winter Terrace, but extended out to other communities where there are inclusion, no matter what race you are, no matter what it is, they bring the whole community together. And that's what we need because Park Slope Winter Terrace is one community. You need to bring Kensington, Ditmas Park, Coney Island Avenue, all together. We need a retail space there. We need a grocery store. We've been saying this for years. I grew up at the stables. I worked there for 30 years. I rode horses, I rode bikes. The traffic is the traffic. No matter what you build there, we're gonna have traffic at rush hour and we're gonna have traffic from four to six every day. It's been like that forever. And we have to keep Coney Island safe also. That area has been a dead spot. Opening up an establishment like this brings the whole neighborhood together. You have people from Coney Island, you have people all over the neighborhood doing this. There's a lot of things in our community that we need and the church and Pastor Ray has brought that community together. There's no reason to oppose this. Please take it into consideration. This is great for our community, Time great expired. for all people, everybody in the neighborhood. There's Windsor Terrace, Kensington, Crown Heights, Ditmas Park, and there's all kinds of different languages. The school provides 30 different languages. So there's 100 plus seats at that school. I have friends that sent their kids there Thank you, for 20 years. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for your testimony. You didn't give me a couple extra seconds. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your help in putting this together. You got it. Thank you, Forrest. Ronald Longhoffer, we the next speaker, followed by Valerie Goulborn. Starting time. What'd you think? All right, good afternoon, council members. I appreciate the opportunity to speak at this hearing. My name is Ronald Longhoffer. I live at 314 Vanderbilt Street in the Windsor Terrace neighborhood of Council Landers District here, 39. I've lived in Brooklyn for over 31 years. 25 of those years have been in Windsor Terrace. And I'm speaking today in support of the proposed development at 312 Coney Island Avenue. Uh, I am particularly supportive of the project because over 70 affordable units will be included, uh, units that are needed in our neighborhood. And regarding the other units, supply and demand indicates that this development will help keep rents from rising as quickly as without it. So I understand the affordable concern of some, but I think more units, will, you know, it's bound to help. Uh, additionally, the proposed design provides an attractive building that I think will upgrade the ambiance of Park Circle and serve as a gateway to, to Park Circle, to Prospect Park, and to Winter Terrace itself. Uh, a significant side benefit is that the building will largely block from view the massive Cube Smart building. And uh, that's, that's uh, you know, only a couple of stories difference in height from the proposed uh, development. 
And so I think it's, it's going to be a necessary size really to, to, to uh, coordinate with that. Regarding concerns about traffic, I can kill commiserate. The park circle is a mess. I get that. Um, I don't believe that the objection about traffic, though, is really valid, considering that a few dozen um, vehicles added to the area should not really impact the thousands of vehicles that travel through the circle every day. And finally, I'm a member of International Baptist Church, and this development, if approved, will provide an exceptional opportunity to improve both our church's presence and our Christian school day, Christian day school's functionality uh, in Windsor Terrace and the surrounding communities. I strongly urge you to approve the project for our ministry and for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ronald. Next speaker on the panel will be Valerie Gulborn, followed by Yvette Bennett. Starting time. Hello, my name is Valerie Gulborn, and I am in favor of this development, development, development project. I live at 314 Vanderbilt Street for four and a half years and in, um, in this community for about eight and a half years. I am a member of International Baptist Church. The church has been a home away from home for me for many years, and I know a lot of other congregants feel that way. At International Baptist Church, I have found a group of people who care about each other and take care of each other. I am also grateful for it. This project would have a huge impact on our church. The project will give our church new and better facilities and well as well as the financial resources to continue to run its resource its services and community programs. Again, I support and I am for this project and I thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. And the last speaker on the panel will be Yvette Bennett. Starting time. Hello, my name is Yvette Velasquez Bennett and I have lived on 10th Avenue in Windsor Terrace for over 40 years. I want to thank Chairman Moya, Council Member Landry, uh, Lander rather, and the City Council for this uh, opportunity to speak in favor of the proposed project at 312 Coney Island Avenue. I want to explain some of the reasons why I support this project. First, the project that's proposed is a unique opportunity in a unique location. This location on a large property on the traffic circle is one of the few in the area that could support a building of these proportions without seeming out of place. Secondly, it would provide a large number of affordable housing units, which is in a need in the community. Um, thirdly, residents at, at this facility would provide a boost to local business. A hotel or other facility built here, as of right, would not benefit the local community. It would benefit people outside the community. Fourth, the development would also provide new facilities for the school and church that is currently on the site. And lastly, past attempts at this type of residential development and residential rezoning have been turned down. One of those resulted in a hideous self storage building being built as a right with the existing zoning. This building now looms over the traffic circle, which is a gateway to our community. This new proposal would hide most of that building from sight lines in Prospect Park and the traffic circle, providing a much more beautiful and welcoming gateway into this wonderful community. I would urge the city council to approve the proposal. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Yvette. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, council, do we have any council members with questions uh, for this panel? Oh, Chair, I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay, thank you. There being uh, no more questions for this panel, uh, the witness panel is now excused. The next panel will include Todd Wheat, Mark Duffin, MC Forel, and Jan Degnan. First speaker will be Todd Weeks, followed by Mark Duffin. Starting time. Hi, my name is Todd Weeks. Uh, thank you to Chair Moya and thank you to the members of the Land Use Committee and the Council and staff. 
So this building, uh, along with two other structures that have already been approved at 57 Caton will bring approximately a thousand residents into our neighborhood within the next two to three years. And that's a conservative estimate. This community is vehemently opposed to this overdevelopment. This is a diverse middle-class neighborhood. Uh, most of the people who live here spend more than 50% of their income on rent. Uh, and you know we have progressive values in this neighborhood. This project does not, does not reflect the community's values. The project, is essentially an example of the city ceding power to a corporate entity. Uh, JMB, JEMB is an international developer. They seek to monetize park use for one percenters. And they're not really interested in giving back to the community, except uh, potentially with raising our rents. This building is gonna have an overall negative impact on our neighborhood. We need a lower building. We need a less dense building that is more in keeping with, as has been stated, with the, the community aesthetic. Uh, none of the recommendations of CB7, the nine story limit have been taken into account. We are in favor of a reasonable structure that comports with middle class, progressive, and I say progressive, I mean economically progressive values that are here in this community. And the council member has a career of espousing these values, championing progressive values. He's worked with organized labor, LGBTQ, BLM, anti-racist, anti-Trump, uh, participatory budgets. We applaud all of this. Uh, but how is this building as proposed part of that vision? Uh, the church that seeks to gain uh, likely $12 million at least on a 99 I'll just finish by saying the church does not share these values. If they did, they would reach out to the community. If the subcommittee and the council wants to listen to their constituents, listen to the community, we applaud that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Todd. Next speaker will be Mark Duffin, followed by MC Morell. Starting time. Hi, um, thank you for taking time to listen to me today. I just wanted to say that um, I support having the church and having its facilities there and the, the church members getting all of those things in the school. That's great. I support having a development here, just not this one. This one is oversized and utterly inappropriate to the neighborhood. I feel like it's been a disingenuous presentation from the start. Um, the environmental assessment statement is basically statistical gymnastics to justify um, whatever the developers want, putting you know this giant building here where no other uh, precedent exists for it, um, you know, it's utterly unrealistic to compare this to Grand Army Plaza or every example they show in their presentation are downtown buildings. Um, this the architect makes high rises in Dubai and China and the developer makes malls in Miami and Montreal and casinos in Atlantic City. We don't need these in, that's not Machate Circle. Grand Army Plaza is not Machate Circle. It's not downtown Brooklyn. This building is twice the size of anything else. It needs to be reduced, period. And inclusionary housing, when you have 75% of luxury housing is not an excuse for it. Finally, I would just like to say in this, as well as earlier meetings, you have the actual leadership team of the church, Christopher Kazis, Mr. Longhofer, who are employees of the church, who are showing up without identifying themselves and acting as if they're concerned citizens. The bulk of the people who come and testify for this project are members of the church or whose kids go to the school. I support them getting what they want, what they need, their financial security. I just don't support it at the huge detriment to everybody else in this community. I think it's offensive and needs to be addressed and not you know, ut utterly disregarded by the planning commission when the CB7 was very emphatic about this, when the borough president was emphatic about this. They should not be just- Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Thank you. They should not be just taking Thank no consideration for the community. Thank you. The next speaker will be MC Forel, followed by the last speaker on the panel, Jan Degnan. Hi, time. good afternoon. Oh, sorry. 
Um, good afternoon and thank you for your time and for, for uh, holding this hearing. I wanna echo um, the concerns of all the other community members who have spoken against this project. Um, I am a relatively new member of this community. I'm also a store manager at the Windsor Terrace Food Co-op. Although I speak in my personal capacity, I do not speak for the co-op, but working at the co-op has given me a sort of unique insight into the community. Um, I agree that the developer's presentation felt a little disingenuous. I appreciate some of the lengths they've gone to, um, but have noticed among my um, neighbors uh, hearing that uh, frustration that they haven't reached out to us. And so I, I ask the members of the church um, to see who support this project to imagine, to, to try to understand why people who aren't of the church are, are against it and see if you, you can find a way to help us feel as strongly about a proposed project on the site as you do. Because if there's a mismatch then, then there's something wrong. I also found it interesting that the developers chose very specific angles for the mock-ups that they showed, none of them showing the, the view down the other side of Caton or down the other side of East Fifth, where what you would see are three-story buildings, at most the six-story building that I used to live in, um, and you would see, if you saw those angles, how disproportionate this building is um, in this area. And so I echo the concerns that um, this is not Grand Army Plaza. This is a very different area where an imposing facade like that just doesn't fit. It would not be a welcoming gateway into Windsor Terrace. It would feel like this monolith that just rises above everything else around it. Um, and I also echo the concerns about infrastructure. I believe that the developers have not taken that into account, at least not in their presentation. Um, the schools and the food infrastructures and the public transport, not the public transportation, but like the biking and pedestrian infrastructures need to be at least presented more clearly in order to show that this development would not have a harmful impact on it. Thank you for, for giving me this time. Thank you. Last speaker on the panel will be Jan Degnan. Starting time. Good morning. Um, my name is Jan Degnan. I live in 10 Ocean Parkway. Um, you can hear me, right? We can hear you. Great. Um, I live in 10 Ocean Parkway across from the proposed developmental site. I lived here for a very long time, um, almost 20 years. I've enjoyed living across from the church because I find the church pretty. I find the lawns, the open lawns very welcoming when I walk on that side of the street. I very much am aware that um, the church and its members really are interested in getting a new facility. I want that for them also. I'm a freelance musician. I work all over town singing, uh, creating musical experiences, concerts, in and out of church settings. I realize that that church needs a facility to meet its needs and also wishes to extend that out more to the community. Um, I think that is terrific. I do support that. What I have consistently heard about this development, I am, cannot say I am support as is. I oppose the development as is for several reasons. This is not downtown Brooklyn. Downtown Brooklyn and Park uh, Grand Army Plaza are consistently being referred to as the touch points for a development of this size. Machati Circle, where the church is now and on this end of the park is purposely different. It is three times smaller than the other park circle that is being referenced there i heard today it was consistent with framing the pub the brooklyn public library frames grand army plaza machate circle is not grand army plaza we have an arch that does reflect grand army plaza it is a much smaller arch this this area is not going to be served by something of that magnitude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, council, do we have any uh, council members with questions for this panel? No, Chair, I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay, great. There being no more questions for this uh, panel, the witness panel is now excused.
The next panel will include Michelle Phillips, Rachel Cizak, Rebecca Dennis, and Geraldine Beauville. First speaker will be Michelle Phillips, followed by Rachel Cizak. Starting time. Hi there, uh, my name is Michelle Phillips and my family lives at 370 East 2nd Street here in 11218 in the 39th Council District. I'm appearing today in support of the proposed rezoning. I think it's always important to build affordable housing, but I want to stress how important it is to introduce affordable housing to neighborhoods like this one. Um, it seems like this nation is looking for real change. And right now it doesn't seem like the city's zoning changes are happening in the city's more affluent areas. The Windsor Terrace neighborhood is majority white with many high earning residents. Opponents of this project are happy to support affordable housing of this size in other neighborhoods, but that would reduce the affordable housing here by half for a nostalgic view of what their neighborhoods should look like. Uh, there has to be new housing opportunities in the more exclusive areas of the city too. This location is perfect for the uh, proposed project. It's near buses, the subway, bike lanes. It's an easy commute to Manhattan and it's across the street from one of the biggest parks in the city, beautiful Prospect Park, uh, which would be great for the residents. I think it's a great location and it's justified. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker will be Rachel Cizak, followed by Rebecca Dennis. Starting time. Rachel, whenever you're ready. Um, my name is Rachel Zak, and I live at 314 Vanderbilt Street. Um, I pretty much just echo what everybody's been saying in agreement to this project. Um, I've been in this district District 39 for about five and a half years. And I love this neighborhood. And I think that this project is gonna be a great addition. Um, and I love that they're bringing in more um, apartments and affordable living so that we can see our community thrive. So I just thank you for considering this project. Thank you, Rachel. Next, we'll hear from Rebecca Dennis, followed by Geraldine Bogle, who will be the last speaker on this panel. Starting time. Good afternoon. I want to thank you for your time. Um, I just would like to say that um, I'm, I mean, I echo with everyone who's for this project. And for me, it's it's personal. Um, I have lived in this district for almost 28 years, but I speak not only for myself, but represent a family of three. Before my husband and I got married, we had a very hard time looking for affordable housing within the district. Our search, our search took over a year and kept us from getting married sooner because we wanted to make sure that we had housing first. Um, we have since made another move due to needing more room for our baby. And we've been blessed with enough space and affordable rent, but only because we knew the owner of the property. Otherwise it would not have been possible. Um, this housing, however, is temporary and will only last a few years. I am concerned about the daunting task of finding affordable housing again that will be big enough for our family of three or more. Knowing that more affordable housing may be available in this district in the future gives me hope of housing security um, for my family in the future. Therefore, I am for the rezoning. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. The last speaker will be Geraldine Beauville. Starting time. Hi, my name is Geraldine Beauville. For the past 30 years, I have lived seven minutes from International Christian School. My children have been enrolled as students at the school for the past seven years. I appreciate the small classroom environments of less than 15 students. The school is affordable and a safe place for my children to learn academics in the Christian faith. This project would provide affordable housing for young families, seniors, and people with limited income. International Christian School's mission statement is to elevate a student's love for God and country. 
This project will also elevate the community by providing affordable housing in a state-of-the-art school. I am in support of the proposed rezoning for 312 Coney Island Avenue. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Geraldine. Thank you all for your testimony today. Uh, council, do we have any council members that uh, wish to ask this panel any questions? Chair, I see no uh, members with questions for the panel. Great, thank you. There being no more questions for this panel, the witness uh, panel is now excused. Council, can you please call up the next panel? The next panel will include Lars Engstrom, Sergio Vieira, and Tricia Bastian. First hear from Lars Engstrom and then Sergio Vieira. Morning, Hi, can you hear? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, um, I just wanted to, I'm in a, a resident of uh, 30 Ocean Parkway. I've been here for 17 years and uh, my wife, Tricia has been a resident for 30. And um, I understand the need for affordable housing because uh, we live here because we could afford it at the time we moved here. And if we had to find a new place to live in this neighborhood, we probably couldn't. And that's to, that's to be said for just about every neighborhood in Brooklyn now. Um, my opposition to the project is twofold. One is it's oversized for community, but uh, more importantly, 75% uh, luxury housing is not gonna do anything for lowering the rents in the neighborhood. Also, the apartment buildings that are immediately on the circle are not affluent. They're rent stabilized apartment buildings and the people who live in those buildings will be most negatively affected by the increased traffic, both by the construction and by the oversized development in its place. I also think that there's been a lot of disingenuousness uh, about how this project has been presented, whether it's using um, the threat of a hotel that would be even higher if this did not get approved. Um, I've noticed there's a lot of pro um, statements today on the panels of names that I recognize as local real estate agents and they did not identify themselves as that. And also the claims that they, uh, from Councilman Brad Lander that, they're in, that the church is an integral part of the community. I have had friends who have been congregants and even had students, uh, kids and students, but they never post any sort of uh, schedule of when their services are and frankly, uh, one of the pastors there, the one who spoke earlier, is uh, an outspoken LGBTQ plus um, uh, opponent of, of those rights. And I don't think that reflects the neighborhood, unlike the Episcopal Church down the street that openly goes for its services, um, uh, allows the space to be used by um, self-support groups. I don't think that this is above board. And um, I again, I, I think that there is a definitely affordable housing but this is not an affordable housing solution. It's, it's false. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Moving to the next panel. The next speaker will be Sergio Vieira, followed by Tricia, Tricia Bastian. Starting time. Hello. Hello, thank you for giving me the floor. Um, I'm also against uh, rezoning for such a massive uh, development. And essentially, one of the concerns, besides all the concerns already um, identified, it's how these 75% of luxury units uh, will impact the displacement of middle-income families in, the, in this area. Um, and how this essentially contradicts, contradicts the city and also council member Landers' uh, attempt to have a more integrated neighborhood and and uh, schools um, as we know this building is about 278 uh, units which means 900 residents 75% uh, of which will be high income uh, residents and and we tend to oppose that with the 20 or to look at the 25% of MIH but that will not be enough to offset uh, the impact of those of those 75% uh, luxury uh, units. Um, so I think if we really are serious about having more integrated neighborhoods and schools, there should be a more consistent and coherent policies between 
the school uh, policies, the social policies, and the and the approval of this type of development. As of now, um, I see here uh, a negative impact with and to this essentially aggravated trend that we already have seen in this area, but also in Brooklyn in general. And so I don't think this will really benefit middle income families. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Last speaker on this panel will be Tricia Bastian. Starting time. Hello? Hello? Go ahead, Tricia, we can hear you. Oh, thank you. I just broke my glasses. So um, first of all, I just want to start. I've lived in the neighborhood for 30 years since I was a young woman. Um, my chant for all of the neighborhoods in New York City and all of the boroughs is we've got to stop lot line to lot line developments that crowd the sidewalk and leave no room for a dandelion, no room for grass that remediates water because we've got climate change. And this neighborhood is at the bottom of the hill. We have massive problems with a uh, standing puddles, large puddles, and we need to, oh, sorry, I should hold the camera back. I was just told. <laughs> but I just wanna say, Mr. Bernstein, I've got all these papers on so camera one said, I think you text. Frederick Law Olmsted designed that corner as a sweep of open air and space, giving breathing rooms to the other buildings and to pedestrians and people walking by. Um, one of the developers, Zach, I believe it was, he offered a reality check for the neighborhood saying that um, Coney Island Avenue, about Coney Island Avenue is a, yes, it is a, becoming a pedestrian hostile canyon with lot line to lot line, no room for dandelion uh, developments that are chasing out the quaint shops. He said there was no quaintness. There's a lot of quaint shops by recent immigrants. And now it's becoming a homogeneous thing of, of going out of business uh, stores. Um, tr the traffic complaints are actually noise complaints. And shifting the bulk of the building towards the park will be blasting noise directly into the park directly to across the lake, which is a great, and then also this design, the, it replaces the open areas and trees that they're remediating carbon. I just can't say that I want a school. I want a building, I want some amenities, but it doesn't have to be to the sidewalk. There's a beautiful sweeping lawn with beautiful trees. And I believe that this thing is out of context is something, this doesn't belong really anywhere in a neighborhood. This is not a neighborhood building. This is not a neighborhood building. This is a downtown building that they're trying to put next to the park. and we. You have to leave stepping stones. It's a design concept of borrowed scenery. You can't just build concrete up to the park. They are literally paving over a gorgeous lawn. Where are the children going to play? Fire. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today. Uh, council, is there um, any council members uh, with questions for this panel? No, Chair, I see no members with questions for this panel. Okay, thank you. There being no more questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. Council, if you can please call up the next panel. The next panel will include Justin Tatham, Novita Mason, Jessica Park, Marta Reyes, and Ian Smoliak. The first speaker will be Ian Smoliak, followed by Justin Tatham. Starting time. You gotta unmute um, yourself. Hello. I, uh, Ian or Iowan Smoliak will be the first speaker. Followed by Justin Tatham. Hello. Yep, we can hear you. Yes, hi. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Iowan Smoliak, and uh, I, I came in this country like a young. I was really, really young. Okay. In the meantime, I. I got a family. I live in this area for 22 years, uh, and I come to ask you to approve the proposal for the 312 Coney Island Avenue because not only because I think it will be good for this community, entire community, but also because of how it will benefit my children. Uh, ICS is an affordable option that maintains a strong academic curriculum and for small classes, si uh, classroom sizes. A, par a parent does not have to be wealthy to send their children to this school because the school works to keep the tuition affordable. And the teacher at ACS, ICS love their students 
and the children thrived in this environment. The project will create a new school with rec recreational space for the students, since it will be include a gymnasium and a playground and uh, a lot of op opportunity for this uh, neighborhood. And in such time we live right now, in a certain time, I think uh, the world community is gonna benefit from this project. And I am in favor for this development. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and uh, council members and uh, uh, especially the Mr. Francesco Moya, which uh, allow me to talk on this um, Zoom. And thank you for allowing me to speak. And thank I you. guess it uh, will be a, a great, uh, if they're gonna be approved, it's gonna be uh, very good for the children, which can benefit from this in years to come and more privilege for kids in the city to get and to learn and to have such a good uh, uh, results. Okay, I, I in favor for this project. And thank you so much, sir, for allowing me to thank, talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony today. The next speaker will be Justin Tatham, followed by Novita Mason. Starting time. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Justin Tatham. I've lived in the area in Park Slope for um, almost eight years. I'm up by the Pardo Pritchett Square um, area, but I did discover the church within the past couple of years. I've been attending since then. I do speak in favor of the church, uh, uh, the redevelopment. Um, primary reason is, is the affordable housing. My children are elementary school students here. The schools are great but there is not a lot of economic diversity. And I believe that economic diversity is just as important as any other kind. And uh, 70 affordable housing units, that's dozens and dozens of kids who will have the opportunity to grow up right on the park and enjoy you know, what is a true blessing uh, for children. You know, Play out there every day, learn to fish, learn to ride a bike, just real opportunities that wouldn't otherwise exist. I respect the concerns of everyone who've uh, spoken against it. But I think the, the reality of the situation is the only way to uh, have lower rents and um, more spaces is to build new apartments. Um, it's the only way out of the housing crisis in New York. And the reality is that uh, the only way to get things like this done are public, uh, uh, I'm sorry, private enterprises where there is a mixed blend of people who are uh, subsidizing the lower cost uh, affordable housing. So I think it will be a benefit uh, eventually economically as well, and that you'll, uh, within a few years of this development, you will see shops, restaurants, all the things that uh, surround Bartle Pritchett uh, Circle up um, by the Pavilion Movie Theater. You'll see things like that start to open up. That's jobs uh, that impacts people's lives on a daily uh, basis. And I think uh, that's even more important as we come out of a pandemic where we have uh, economic opportunities and uh, are helping people who need to move into what's a great community. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. The next speaker will be Novita Mason, who will be followed by Jessica Park. Starting time. Um, hello everyone, my name is Novita Mason. I am a resident of Dickmas Park. I am a parent of four students that attend International Christian School. As a parent, I must say I love this school, academic-wise, spiritual-wise, and overall, it's just a safe place for my children. I'm very excited about the new development plan for the building. The improvement will bring more class classrooms, more programs, and most importantly, it will bring a gym for our students. This plan will not only provide an upgraded building, it brings equity to the neighborhood and for our surrounding neighbors. I think this is a much needed project for our area. It provides homes for new residents and quality education for our children and an overall improvement to our community. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Jessica Park, followed by Marta Reyes. Starting time. Hi, my name is Jessica Park. I live in the neighborhood off of Coney Island Avenue. 
My family has been in this location for about 18 years and we strongly favor the rezoning at 312 Coney Island Avenue. Um, all three of our children have been students at the school and we have been so thankful for the diverse, loving school community it provides as well as the quality, affordable education. All three girls have benefited from small classroom sizes, involved, dedicated teachers who love them so much. I have been so thankful for such a caring community in the midst of such a large, large city. Um, the rezoning and the development of 312 Coney Island would allow us to have better facilities, including a gymnasium, a playground, which we have never had. So I hope you will consider this and thank you so much. Thank you. And the last speaker on this panel will be Marta Reyes. Starting time. Martha? Hello? Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Martha Reyes, and I live in this area for over 30 years. My husband and I, along with four children, love this community. I am thankful for having the park in the neighborhood, much like Mac earlier had mentioned that th that was our backyard as well. Raising our children in this area has been a huge blessing. I do love the church and the school in the community. I love that we have nearby transit, markets, and um, just so much more places to even go out and eat as a family on a Sunday afternoon has been a blessing for us as well. This development that I am in favor of is a huge blessing to our community. Living here so many years, I've seen a lot of changes and it's always been for the better. And I must say that I believe this development is still in that direction for the better of our community, for families. And I love most of all that it offers affordable housing for families much like mine that probably wouldn't otherwise be able to live here in this area. I am in favor and I do hope that you approve of this development. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Council, do we have um, any council members that have questions for this panel? Jeremiah, council member Lander has a hand up for uh, the panel. Um, I, I was, I don't have questions for this panel, but I, th I thought that was the last of the testimony. Is, is that correct? Or is there more, are there we're, more? We're, we're checking, Brad, give us a second and. Right. Council member, we're about to uh, check now. Two more. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this time, if there are any other members of the public who wish to testify on the pre-considered LU items for the 312 Coney Island Avenue rezoning proposal, we ask that you please press the raise hand button uh, now. And we will now stand the meeting at ease uh, briefly while we check uh, for anyone remaining waiting to testify. Chair Moya, we have uh, one remaining witness 
uh, who had registered to testify. We are now going to hear from Linda Brilliant. Linda Brilliant will be the next speaker. Starting time. Yes, hello, Linda Brilliant. Yeah. I used to live in Ocean, I tell you. You can you hear me? We can hear you, Linda. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. You're good, Linda. Okay, Ocean Avenue. I used to live on Ocean Avenue and could tell you her road. Okay, I, we, I was being harassed. Um, all types of stuff was being done to us so we can move out of the apartment so they can rent to white people. Okay, thank God my mother's not homeless yet. Okay, it's a constant worry every day that we're gonna be homeless. Okay, people are being removed from, from these buildings Forced into the streets, okay, so other people can move in. They want to raise the rent while the apartments are no good, okay? While living at 781 Ocean Avenue on the second floor, water will come down on us from the third floor, okay? Not only the men attack me, physically try to kill me for these apartments, okay? I went all the way to the Supreme Court so I can get justice, nothing. We, we lived there since 1980. I grew up in the neighborhood. It's a very nice neighborhood. It's a very good neighborhood, but there's too many people there. It's way overcrowded. There's other places that you can develop. Okay, I don't mind moving, but, be, but because of the land where I was blocked from working, if I was working, I would mm -hmm. gladly move because there's too many people living in that area. Not mm -hmm. only people are being forced out of their homes, but we have no decent bathroom to use. The streets are filled with human feces. You say COVID, COVID, but the street is dirty. How can you not get a disease from all this the, the things in the street? We're being moved, we, we, we bring, we're being thrown out of our home so other people can move in. And the rent is sky high. It's too much, too much development, too many. If you look at the Cotelli Road um, train station, it's packed. But if you go to Beverly Road train station, there's nobody there. I used to go to Cotelli Road train station. I had to leave the Cotelli Road train station because there's too many people on that station to go to Beverly Road because there's nobody on Beverly I'm Road. I'm fired. Linda, if, if you could, can you just, for the record, uh, can you just tell us which project you're testifying on? I'm testifying on being, people being, being torn out of their homes. I got it. What project is, is the one that you're, you're testifying on? I don't, I don't know about anything about any project. Well, I'm saying that. It's, it's too much development over there. It's too crowded. Right. Are you talking about Coney Island? I'm talking about all, all the area. Okay. People Thank you so much. Of... Thank you, yes. Linda. Thank you. Thank you. Council, any uh, other panelists? Chair Moya, there are no uh, other witnesses who are registered to testify. Do we have any council members who wish to ask this panelist any questions? I do see that council member Lander has a hand up uh, uh, for a statement. Sure, I was just looking to make a kind of closing statement of gratitude for all the testimony we've heard so far. Is it okay to go and do that or do you want to close the testimony first? Uh, let me excuse the panel and then I'll turn over. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So um, there be, if there being no other members of the public who wish to testify in the pre-considered uh, LU items for Coney Island Avenue rezoning items. Um, if there, yeah, if they wish to testify on this, this issue, uh, the zoning tax application, this public hearing uh, is now closed and the items are laid over. Uh, that, before we go and conclude today's business, let me turn it over uh, to Council Member Leonard for some very brief remarks, yeah. please. Well, partly I just want to thank you for sticking around and, and making it possible for us to have this hearing. It took a lot of time and we heard a lot of people. I'm grateful to everybody who showed up. This is how democracy is supposed to work. You know, it doesn't always work that there's an exactly equal number of panels pro and con on a project. And that doesn't always make the decision making easier on a situation like this but it's exactly what's supposed to happen. And I appreciate that this many people love their neighborhood um, and wanna come out and talk about what they think about its future. So we will spend a lot of time reviewing the data, listening, talking, asking some more questions, trying to figure out what the right approach forward is. 
but I'm grateful for everyone that took the time today. And I'm especially grateful to Chair Moya and to the staff of the committee uh, who make it possible for us to do this, even though they live far away from our neighborhoods in a lot of cases. So thanks to everyone who participated and we will be following up in the near future. Thank you, council member. Uh, and that concludes today's business. Uh, I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, uh, the subcommittee council, uh, land use and other council staff and the sergeant at arms for participating in today's meeting. Uh, thank you to our council, uh, Arthur, who's uh, always keeping us on track uh, in these long meetings. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned.